Before we begin, I want to say hello to the poor Amazon guy who's going to be asked to watch this video with the aim of finding a tiny piece of footage to randomly claim on copyright grounds, thereby getting this video blocked. I know you're there, because I've uploaded several versions of this now, and I keep getting emails telling me that someone has manually claimed fragments of the content contained herein. I don't blame you personally. You're only following orders, after all. Your employer is incredibly sensitive to criticism of its billion-dollar production. From largely unfounded claims of racism to attacks on fans, to propaganda pieces placed in client magazines, to wiping out negative reviews in a bogus attempt to combat review bombing, defined as any review not lavishing praise on Amazon's abuse of Tolkien, his mythos, and his fans, your employer has undoubtedly told you to do whatever you can to limit the number of negative reviews posted to YouTube. And in this, YouTube's ridiculous copyright system that allows you to yeet content for up to a month on no sustainable basis, and that doesn't punish you for frequent abuse of that same system, well, that system is your friend. I have no doubt you will try the same tactic with this video too. Again, I've lost count of the number of times you've done it already. Not that you'll pay any attention to this, because you're not being paid to be honest or to have integrity, but the clips I've cut from your employer's garbage show are all under 9 seconds long. They are all context sensitive. They all illustrate points made in a review. They have all been heavily transformed. They in no way serve as a substitute for the original content. They meet every single one of the criteria for fair use. I've spent the better part of two weeks ensuring that this is the case. Unlike your employer, some of us actually take art seriously. We believe we have both a right and an obligation to critique and to criticize it where it deserves criticism. Reviews have been a form of artistic production for as long as art has been a thing. I am exercising that right here, within the bounds of YouTube's terms of service, and within the legal definition of fair use. So before you inevitably pick another 7 second clip at random, claim it for copyright purposes and get this video banned again, ask yourself, is it really worth this? Are you really being paid enough for this? Isn't there anything you could be doing with your life that's more productive and fulfilling than making my life difficult? Do you really like the taste of Jeff Bezos' boot that much? One way or another, this video is going up. I've re-edited it multiple times rather than wait the month for my challenge to be successful, as it certainly would be, for the reasons already stated. You can carry on wasting your life by making mine more difficult if you want to. I'd say I hope it's worth it, but it isn't, is it? And I'm sure you can see that. I'm sure you know it deep down. There's only so long you can defend the indefensible without sacrificing whatever is left of your dignity. So do the grown-up thing. Be honest, let this video go, and get a better fucking job. Lots of love! My kids have become Tolkien fans as well. In fact, one of my boys, I think, approaches the level of a Tolkien scholar. Uh, he knows so much about this universe. And after Amazon got involved in this project, uh, my son came up to me one day. He looked me in the eyes very sincerely. And he said, Dad, please don't F this up. One hour later. I'm not sure that there has ever been a media phenomenon so dreaded and so anticipated as Rings of Power. Months, months and months and months, has it even been years now? For months or for years anyway, Rings of Power has been dissected, interrogated and cross-examined in potentia and in abstentia. It now appears in the dock to find that in the minds of a great many people, the judgment has already been handed down. Besides one live stream several months ago, we have so far done nothing on Rings of Power on the Little Platoon. And this is despite being big Tolkien fans. I'm sitting next to the special edition of the complete history of Middle-earth. I can recite Tolkien's poetry from memory. I know the songs from the old 70s BBC radio adaptation from heart. This vies with Star Wars for my one cold black heart's affections. But I've quite deliberately done nothing on Rings of Power until this point. I've not even spent much time reading the countless think pieces and teasers and trailers and puff articles and preemptive criticisms. I don't begrudge those who have. 
But it seems to me that Rings of Power has come to serve as a kind of culture war in being, not quite present, but undeniably there. You can't see it, but you can't deny it. As a result, the release of Rings of Power doesn't feel so much like a beginning as it feels like an end to its own story. Look around the media, or indeed on YouTube, and you'll see it greeted as the fantastic or terrible culmination of a masterwork or a fucking travesty. And look, I get it. One of the most satisfying formulations in the English language is, I told you so. I'm a sucker for that kind of thing. But I do cling to this vague and old-fashioned idea of cultural criticism that holds that the point is to judge and not to prejudge a thing. So, sure, I understand the urge, and I do sympathize with it, I know the arguments. Rings of Power has disavowed its heritage, it set aside Tolkien, it sought to use the works of better men to propagate its own modern and obsessively current ego. As such, it can fuck off to hell, and then it can carry on fucking. Yep, I get all of that. But we still have a show to review. Life retains its capacity to surprise us. Prejudging is fantastic for cultural propaganda, but it is the enemy of sober criticism. There is a difference between fighting a war against corporate wokeism and its media monopoly, and treating the products of same as distinct works to be evaluated on their own merits, or lack thereof. That's why I've said nothing so far about Rings of Power, and maybe I was wrong not to say anything. I've certainly missed out on the views and the subs, but don't mistake that for me being naive. I didn't expect anything good from this show, and I don't expect anything good of any show. My approach for good or for ill has been to wait and see, and then to form my opinion, expect nothing and you can only be pleasantly surprised. So with that lengthy introduction out of the way, has Rings of Power accomplished anything good? Um, well, well, let's put it this way, I've kept my powder dry and now I have a big fucking cannon ready to go and I'm about to set it off. Before we get to the plot, an extended metaphor. I believe Jeff Bezos when he says he has been a huge fan of Tolkien since he was a teenager. It's evident, I think. It plays to his character. Here is a man with ambition, pretensions toward the grand, a world-scale view. Here is a creator and an entrepreneur, someone who has built a vast empire, an entire ecosystem in which we all now live. My history of Middle-earth was delivered by Amazon, after all. A man like that can look at the immense, world-creating imagination of Tolkien and find so much in it to admire. This fantastic mythos, its incomparably grand scale, its moral drive, its direction, its ordered cosmos, its genre-defining scope, its ingenuity, everything about Tolkien's creation cries out to the ultra-entrepreneurial mind. The drive, the scope, the scale, the legacy, you can see why these things appealed to Bezos. But the entrepreneurial mind misses the most important detail of Tolkien's life and of his works, the morality, the ethos, the spirit, and the soul of what he made. Here was a man who loathed allegory, which is a point we'll be coming back to, believe me. And so in a sense he rejected the kind of grandiose purpose that men like Bezos possess. Tolkien did not set out to change the world or to comment upon it. He did not build his world in a bid to define our own, except insofar as he regretted the loss of a North European and particularly an English mythology. But his desire to recreate that wasn't a work of ego, it was a work of pure artistic and imaginative love. Unlike the writers of Rings of Power, I have recourse to the Lost Tales, the Silmarillion, and the Unfinished Tales, so I'm going to use those in a way Tolkien would have despised allegorically. Tolkien here is the Iluvatar figure, the creator, the originator of tales and of songs and life itself, the inspirer, the weaver, the light bringer, whose purpose is divine simplicity, creation for creation's sake. Derivative works are themselves part of his creation, from George R. R. Martin to Robert Jordan, Lynn Flewelling, Terry Brooks, Christopher Paolini, J.K. Rowling, Tolkien's imagination has defined a genre and that genre has since been stewarded by his successors. Carrying on the analogy then, if Tolkien is a Luvatar, he has created a whole cadre of fantasy writing Ainur to shape the world using the gifts he imparted. Carrying it one step further, of the Ainur there is inevitably a Melkor, named Morgoth, the corrupter and creator of Sauron, by Feanor after the darkening of Valinor and his murder of Feanor's father. Look, I should probably say now, if you are here for the plot breakdown, that is coming, don't worry. Sorry if I'm boring you with the deep lore, but since we're not going to get very much of that in Rings of Power, and since Rings Without the Lore isn't really Rings at all, just please bear with me a few minutes longer. Or if you are watching after the premiere, just go to the description for the timestamps and you can get right on with the plot. But carrying on the metaphor, 
In the Aina Lindale, the first chapter of the Silmarillion, Tolkien has Iluvatar create the world by inspiring a chorus of music from the Ainur. They all sing in harmony, but each of them holds a distinct part of the tune that is responsible for the various aspects of creation. It's a lovely, lovely idea. But one of the Ainur, Melkor, plays a satanic role and he serves a Luciferian purpose. Melkor isn't content with his part of the harmony. Melkor wants to create for himself. He wants to shape the world. He has aspirations and selfish inclinations. He's not content with playing a part in creation. He wants to steward creation itself. His ambitions create discord and chaos. Because Tolkien's mythos is complex and spiritually nuanced, he originally has Melkor as closest to Iluvatar in power and vision, knowing some part of each of the harmonies. And the theme of power corrupting is one of the constant undergirding ideas of all Tolkien's work. The Lord of the Rings can seem justly like a relatively simple moral creation, underpinned by a basic belief in the triumph of good over evil. But if you choose to read it more deeply, and certainly if you read the Silmarillion, you see things that aren't quite that simple. Yes, in The Lord of the Rings, good does triumph, but it's not an ultimate triumph. There is always the threat and the possibility of further evil, even if it isn't as grand in scale as Sauron's war against the Free Peoples and his will to dominate all life. Melkor is the progenitor of this idea. Melkor is the origin of chaos in the universe, and his drive is acquisitive and it's egotistical. He corrupts Iluvatar's themes, thereby corrupting some of the Maya, second order creations or demigods, some of whom later become Balrogs and one indeed becomes Sauron himself. Melkor's ego drives him on and it drives him on and on and on. In the end, of course, it transpires that all Melkor's private thoughts and the chaos he reaps are in fact part of Iluvatar's design, and we will come back to that in the end as well. But when he comes to the newly created Earth as one of the Valar, he continues in his will to control and to dominate and to own creation and to shape it as he sees fit. This isn't really evil, not at first, because it is in his nature to do this, and his nature is part of creation and Iluvatar's grander design. But its effects on the children of Iluvatar are evil, even if Melkor could not help his nature. And since what I'm spinning here is all one big detestable allegory, I'm going to close this stupidly long secondary introduction with a quick quotation and invite you to see how well, or not perhaps, but I think how well it matches Bezos' understanding of creation, of Tolkien's creation, and his desire for ownership of it. But now Iluvatar sat and hearkened, and for a great while it seemed good to him, for in the music there were no flaws. But as the theme progressed, it came into the heart of Melkor to interweave matters of his own imagining that were not in accord with the theme of Iluvatar, for he sought therein to increase the power and glory of the part assigned to himself. To Melkor among the Ainur had been given the greatest gifts of power and knowledge, and he had a share in all the gifts of his brethren. He had gone often alone into the void places seeking the imperishable flame, for desire grew hot within him to bring into being things of his own, and it seemed to him that Iluvatar took no thought for the void, and he was impatient of its emptiness. Yet he found not the fire, for it is with Iluvatar. But being alone, he had begun to conceive thoughts of his own unlike those of his brethren. Some of these thoughts he now wove into his music, and straight away discord arose about him, and many that sang nigh him grew despondent, and their thought was disturbed and their music faltered. But some began to attune their music to his rather than to the thought which they had at first. Then the discord of Melkor spread ever wider, and the melodies which had been heard before foundered in a sea of turbulent sound. And indeed one of the continuing themes in the early stages of the Silmarillion is Melkor's general desire, his acquisitiveness, his greed. Not only does he want creation for himself, he wants all created things for himself. So when he later goes and filches the Silmarils from Feanor, things get worse again. But I mention that because, well, I think, hopefully at least, the reason is fairly obvious. It's an allegory that Tolkien would have detested, but can you perhaps see why acquisitive genius and selfishness and greed might perhaps apply to Jeff Bezos, and maybe then the discord that arises from Rings of Power as against the original song sung by Tolkien or Iluvatar. But for the avoidance of doubt, Bezos is not evil, then, in the sense of chosen bad action. If Bezos is Melkor, then it is in his nature to do this. This is what he does. This is what has made him so spectacularly powerful and successful. It's what's allowed him to, and I mean this quite genuinely, add so much of genuine value to our species and our civilization and society, things that seem so natural and commonplace and basically functional to us that we forget how rare an achievement it is. But it's also what leads to his desire to buy a creation and to steward it for himself, to own Tolkien's world, and to exercise his mastery over it. So to round off this section, 
the very love that I do believe Jeff Bezos has for the Lord of the Rings and the world of Tolkien's creation is the very thing that leads, as we will shortly see, to acts of vandalism worthy of Melkor. Like Boromir, who sees the power of the ring but not the point and the purpose of it, Bezos loves but does not understand what he bought. And that is a tragedy. And yet, tragedy is still part of the design. Tolkien anticipated it, even if Bezos did not and could not. I'm going to round off this extended metaphor at the end of the review, but for now, well, we actually do have to review the damn thing, so on with the plot. And if you've got this far thinking I'm a polite and civilized person, eh, prepare for a change in tone. We begin with some children playing while a voiceover pays lip service to the law. There was a time, we are told, when there was no sun, but there was still light, a reference to the creation myth of the Silmarillion, as indeed was the case. Light does not reach Middle-earth for a good long while. Valinor, however, is illuminated by two trees of light, which will later be eaten by Ungoliant, mother of Shelob, as part of Melkor's revenge against the Valar. It's not immediately clear when this opening scene is set, though, because in the lore, the elves do not make their first appearance in Valinor. They live the first moments of their creation in the darkness outside in Middle-earth, and are only brought to Valinor much later. Though not all of them agree to go, and some get lost, and some make it as far as the sea before deciding they'd had enough walking around, we're introduced to the young girl who will go on to become our insufferable heroine. She's made a paper boat that her bratty co-children tell her will not float. She says it isn't going to float, it's going to sail. The paper boat has no sails, so floating is really all it will do. But needless to say, we are not going to look back on this moment as the biggest break with continuity in the show. The boat transforms into a swan-like vessel, but bratty code children throw stones at it and it sinks, so she goes on to try and beat the shit out of one of them, but she is interrupted by Hunky Brother, who breaks up the fight and gives her... Uh, I think, well, it's presented as though it's a moral lesson. Stones, he says, sink because they look downward. I think it has more to do with density, actually, but this is fantasy, so science can fuck off. While ships, by contrast, have a secret... They look up toward the light that guides them. Unfortunately, this sets a standard by which much of the rest of the dialogue abides. If you go back to the books, whether the Silmarillion or the Lord of the Rings, you do not get performative faux profundity of this sort, which is what it is. A writer was given the brief, be mystical, be profound, and this is their laboured response. Things get markedly worse, however, because the little girl says, Sometimes the lights shine just as brightly reflected in the water as they do in the sky. It's hard to say which way is up and which way is down. How am I to know which lights to follow? Um, jump. But more seriously, you might recall that less than a minute ago, we were told that there was a time before the sun. Light does not come from the sun in the sky at this time the little girl is speaking. The light of the world does not come from above. It comes from the trees. So what light in the sky is she referencing here? Now you might think, obviously it could be the moon. But the moon isn't created by the Valar Aule until after the trees are devoured by Ungoliant, so the moon doesn't exist yet. There were stars, but the stars were only visible in areas where the light from the trees was dimmest. In any case, the fact this line is inserted so shortly after a significant point was made of the light's origin just makes this seem, well, odd and lazy. And seemingly insignificant laziness can be significant, boding as it does ill for the future. Hunky Brother looks confused by this, as well he should because it makes no sense. But then he leans in and gives her the patented Biden sniff. Come to think of it, Joe Biden is old enough to have been born in the first age. Could this in fact be a young Joe Biden? Should I be going looking through the Silmarillion for reference to Corn Pop? Or was Corn Pop perhaps his hokey way of making peace with the kinslaying? Of course, Hunky Brother's fate would suggest that it can't be a young Joe Biden, but then again... The dark side of the Force is a pathway to many abilities some consider to be... unnatural. This isn't a nitpick. It might seem like that, but it establishes a consistent theme. The dialogue is like this all the way through. It is designed purely for its effect, with its meaning barely even a consideration. If in the first real exchange between characters, an attempt is being made to convey the seemingness of profundity, even as it contradicts one of the most important parts of the world building we've so far seen, so important that they actually put it in the introductory voiceover, well, that suggests a high degree of carelessness on the writer's part, which we're only going to see more of as this review progresses. 
It wants us to feel as though what we're hearing is meaningful. And so we have the same problem at the close of the exchange. Hunky brother tells little girl that she will one day have to learn these lessons for herself, whatever the fuck the lessons are, because he won't always be there to teach her. She says, you won't, as he walks off. And this is called foreshadowing. Except, of course, that the foreshadowing has been invited by one of the characters, while the voiceover immediately makes that same invitation impossible in-universe, because at this time, the elves do not know death. They have no word for it. They haven't encountered it as a concept or a phenomenon yet. In the lore, this is because death does not come for the elves until a good while after their creation. Now, you can read death into the elves' story before they are brought to Valinor, but if my memory is serving me correctly, the Silmarillion is deliberately opaque about whether the elves truly knew what it was that happened to their disappearing kinsfolk in the darkness of Middle-earth, and more stress is placed on their kidnapping, or potential kidnapping, by the creatures of Morgoth, which I think is also then the origin story of the orcs. They were elves once, taken by the dark powers. The first of the elves known to die in Valinor is Miriel. She did a Padme and died of sad after giving birth to Feanor, though her spirit lived on, so to speak. The first to be killed is Finwë. They are mother and father respectively of Feanor, arrogant and egotistical creator of the Silmarils. Finwë is murdered, as it were, off-screen, leading eventually to his rebellion and to the flight of the Noldor. It's unclear as yet precisely where in time Rings of Power is set, but since the voiceover kindly explains to us that the elves haven't experienced death yet, this, if it were actually part of the same universe that Tolkien created, which it isn't, would mean that we are before the theft of the Silmarils by Melkor, and indeed before Feanor himself was born, and so before death itself. But whatever the case with the lore, per Rings of Power's own setup, Hunky Brother has no business warning little girl that he might not always be there for her, because he has no reason even to conceptualize his own death. To him, death does not exist. This, however, is plot necessary foreshadowing, once again though it is untethered from the show's world building. And, Jesus Christ, we're less than five minutes in. I think this is going to be a long one, folks, so you'd better settle down with a whole bottle. The voiceover continues, fast-forwarding through an awful lot of history, by explaining that the elves thought that their light, the trees, remember, not the sun that she referenced earlier that doesn't exist, they thought that would go on forever. But then, their great foe, Melkor, destroyed the light of their home, leading to the elves going to war. Ugh, for fuck's sake, I might have to start being selective about the lore contradictions. If I point out every single one, this video is going to last several days. But this one seems important enough to mention. No, actually, Melkor did not destroy the trees. That was Ungoliant. Ungoliant devoured everything. She became temporarily more powerful than Melkor himself. Also, no, the elves did not immediately form legions to go to war with Melkor. The entire fucking point of the Silmarillion is, as you might have guessed from the name, the Silmarils. There was a war to retrieve them, but this happens quite a while after the destruction of the trees. It happens long after the first elves take up arms. It is not the reason they take up arms or go to war. The elves fell to rancor and discord while they were still in Valinor. The first of them forged swords to hold as a threat against each other, not to go to war with Melkor. They do go to war with Melkor later to retrieve the Silmarils, and that first involves them in a massacre of their fellow elves, the kinslaying as it's known, the Teleri elves, that sees the Noldor and all of Feanor's house exiled from Valinor. This show, though, presents it as though the death of the trees was the sole reason for their leaving Valinor. It presents it as though they were leaving Valinor for a new world they had never before encountered, when in fact many of them came from there, and it leaves out the kinslaying entirely, and indeed the existence of the Valar entirely. I am not, as I say, going to deconstruct every lore break, but this is the first major one, and it is quite a revealing one, and it should serve to establish a general point that makes it unnecessary to cite every subsequent break, this is not Tolkien's world. This is not the history of his peoples. This is not part of the same universe. This is not what is billed as a prequel to The Lord of the Rings, because it does not inhabit the same universe. If anything, this is fan fiction. As is usual, I will try and praise the show where I can. The first shot of the elves in Middle-earth has them in battle, and the battle initially looks stunning. To borrow from the favoured phrase of the definitely not paid for professional reviewers, it looks cinematic. It's clearly taken inspiration from Peter Jackson's films, and the costume design, the fight aesthetic, even the CGI monsters, all of this looks superb. 
That is the bare minimum you'd expect of a show with this budget, but given we've seen other big budget productions take CGI backward rather than forward, this first blend of the practical and the artificial is very encouraging if what you're looking for is a visual spectacle. If they keep this up, this would be a world deserving a story it hasn't got. That being said, the panning out shot that follows exhibits the favoured flaw of modern CGI practitioners, which is the temptation to blow up the scale. I'm not one of those who regrets the mere existence of CGI, but I think it's undeniable that it leads by its nature to bad practice in other areas of filmmaking, and sloppiness in other areas of storytelling. Think the battle over Exegol in The Rise of Skywalker. If you can reliably produce fantastical scenes at scale, the twofold temptation is a to pay less attention to more important things like scene construction, plot, character, and physics, and b to go over the top in what you depict, because your highest goal is the most superficial one. You want people to be visually impressed. So this first battle scene is quite instructive because it portrays the good and the bad side by side. An intelligent blend of the practical and the CGI in a battle that wants to convey realism, followed then by an overdone megascape of unfathomable size and number because they want you to be impressed. The voiceover continues, telling us that the war left Middle-earth in ruin, and we're then treated to our first glimpse of the heroine of the piece. The show will make a point of calling her Galadriel, but as she is quite clearly not Galadriel because her character, relationships, lineage, actions and behaviour have all been invented for this show, I will make a point of not calling her Galadriel, which, which means she needs a name. The actress is called... oh god, Morph... Morph? It, fuck no, she's Welsh. She's one of Maura's race. Some people say that there are no Welsh women, and the Welsh simply spring out of abandoned mines. Which of course is ridiculous. You can tell a Welsh woman from a Welsh man because the women do not have tentacles, as Maura does. It is said, more reliably, that the Japanese invented hentai because one of them visited a Welsh brothel and saw how the species procreates, and was duly horrified. I'm English, as you might have guessed, that means I'm not obliged to learn how to pronounce silly names found in the colonies. It is the job of these people to catch up with civilization. It is not for the English to lower themselves and make accommodations. So, mighty Morphid power elf here, she goes for a stroll across a battlefield where they have created a big pile of helmets from dead soldiers and learned many words for death. I am struggling to think of very many, to be honest. But perhaps the elves have a more expansive vocabulary, though, given large parts of Elvish were in fact modeled on Welsh, I think they likely just added lots of consonants to the word death and pretended it was a serious language. Death. <laughs> this show is not about the elves' battles with Morgoth, which is a shame. If you're going to make a show set in the Second Age, you might have spent hundreds of millions of dollars buying the rights to that material, rather than the appendices of the Lord of the Rings, which do provide an immense amount of detail, but not the accompanying story. But that is not what Amazon did, and so here we are. So Morgoth is killed off screen and there is still no mention of the Silmarils, or indeed the point of the war to begin with, or who Morgoth was, or why he really mattered, or where he fits in the universe, he is just vague precursor bad guy. This show's bad guy is Sauron, because people have heard of Sauron, and it's an easier pitch to the normies. There is then another stunning visual, as we are introduced to Sauron for the first time in this show, while the voiceover explains why he matters, and what he does, and how evil still exists, and the form it takes. I'll reiterate, the visual is stunning, partly because it is just well shot, but also because it understands the point of symbolism and iconography. This isn't somebody's new idea of Sauron's likeness, this is THE Sauron. This is the one we remember from Peter Jackson's films, with not exact but close enough matching design. Because of the power of symbolism, the shot imbues the character with all the requisite threat, fear, power and menace built up in those films. We immediately know who we're looking at and what his presence means. If they'd just left it at that, this would have effectively recreated the Sauron Peter Jackson's films elevated to iconic villain, and it's invited us back into the existential war against evil that captivated so many people for so long. Of course, this is all still a prologue, and Rings of Power absolutely will not leave it at that. So we're inevitably going to see Sauron diminished in ways so foul even he couldn't have envisaged them, but I'm sure we'll get to that. Rushing through more backstory, we're told Galadriel's brother, one of her brothers if we're following the law, which we aren't, vowed to hunt down and destroy Sauron. But that Sauron found him first and killed him, the payoff to that foreshadowing earlier that really shouldn't have been a thing to begin with. Sauron carved a symbol into Hunky Brother's flesh, but nobody knows what the symbol means, and so mighty Morphid Power Elf committed herself to continuing her brother's mission. Now the voiceover has just finished telling us that even though they defeated Morgoth, his orcs spread all over the world. It then explains that they multiplied and grew in force under Sauron. 
It's important for us to remember this because the voiceover is about to forget it. As it continues to explain, they hunted Sauron for years, for centuries even, all across the earth, and the voiceover explains that many elves just kind of moved on with their lives and uh, assumed Sauron was just a memory. I'm not sure I will ever understand how writers can do this with the worlds they create. You clearly establish the stakes, you clearly set out their magnitude, you clearly put them in context, and if we overlook the fact this is all invented and bears little resemblance at all to the source material, we can say they've done at least a reasonable job of this aspect of the setup. But having so clearly established the stakes and the magnitude and the context, and then found they don't match the story the writers want to tell, the payoff is literally just, they kind of forgot. The elves just forgot Sauron was a thing, or why they were fighting and hunting him, and all that he'd done. And indeed, all he continued to do, because remember, the voiceover literally just finished telling us that evil had spread all over the world and could be seen and felt everywhere. All it would have taken is a single line to say that the orcs had spread all over the world and were driven out of the vast majority of Middle-earth, and Sauron went into hiding. That would then set up the search for him, that would explain why there were no longer any orcs, and why perhaps the elves had begun moving on with their lives. But nah, they just kind of forgot. This is a world-building equivalent of a retard playing Jenga. You maybe get three layers put up in succession, but then, oh shit, spaz hands and the whole thing falls down again. It's almost as though writing is hard for these people. Was this show written by Benioff and Weiss? Speaking of Game of Thrones, the showrunners were obviously impressed by the wall climbing sequence, and so we get to see Mighty Morphid Power Elf doing exactly the same thing, climbing up a frozen cliff next to a waterfall with her merry band of chaps. The merry band is in fact not all that merry. Most of them are quite unhappy at having been dragged across the world by Mighty Morphid Power Elf, and they want to go home. Here we have three of the show's big and ongoing issues presented to us. Bad dialogue, bad acting, massive contradictions. One of the merry men is a bitch. He has a bitch. The words are implausibly perfect and well-constructed and not the kind of thing that sounds natural coming from a tired soldier who has just climbed up a cliff. They are delivered pathetically. The elves are ethereal, of course. They are supposed to be esoteric, but there is a difference between the ornate and aloof grand attachment we see from, say, real Galadriel in The Lord of the Rings and just being a plank of wood. This chap is a plank of wood. They could have cast him as an ent. And then... Having attempted to smooth the contradiction earlier mentioned about the elves just kind of forgetting about Sauron by explaining it's been years since the last orc was sighted, he drops what I think we can politely term a clangor. How long, he asks, and they be expected to wander around where even sunlight fears to tread? Hmm, have you spotted the problem here? Have you noticed that they established Big Bad Guy in the context of light and dark and explained how the cause of the war was the killing of trees and the expunging of light in Valinor. Do you not think that just perhaps a place where sunlight fears to tread is exactly the fucking place you should be looking? Is that not, to use a pun, blindingly fucking obvious? Writing, it's hard, deal with it. He menacingly suggests that they should stop and go home, but she says, nah. So they carry on. They get caught up in a storm, and one of the elves gets injured, Mighty Morphid Power Elf goes to put a cloak over him that apparently is immune to the howling wind. This prompts the bitchy plank from earlier to say, there's nothing out here, we should have been there by now. But then lightning obligingly flashes and reveals that they are there, wherever there is, after all. Again, time for some praise. They brought back Howard Shaw to do the opening theme and they brought in Bear McCreary to do the soundtrack and on occasion, this works. McCreary does have talent. But like Michael Giacchino, He's usually employed as the derivative composer. He's the guy you turn to if you want somebody to recreate the iconic sound of an older composer. He of course has his original works, Battlestar Galactica and Black Sails, but like Giacchino, who is usually the person they get in when they want somebody to do John Williams, McCreary has been asked to do Howard Shaw. And it's good, but it's not profound. I actually admire his ability to emulate the orchestral sound, some of the turns and cadences, hints of the motifs that made Shaw's Lord of the Rings soundtrack so unfathomably spectacular, but Rings of Power soundtrack only vaguely reminds you of Shaw's score, and then only occasionally. It's pleasing enough, even if you'd really like to have heard more of it. You can't imagine the Lord of the Rings with any other soundtrack, and yet McCreary hasn't made himself yet anything like so integral to Rings of Power. But I suppose at least somebody is trying to honour brilliance. I'd prefer that over Hans Zimmer's 30th iteration of the same score. 
or any one of his clones from Remote Control who've made film music so forgettable in recent times. And, again, this is all visually lovely. But, again, it is massively undermined by the dialogue. Inside the fortress, in a sequence that reminds you of Gandalf's exploration of Dol Guldur and The Hobbit, they are said to be freezing. Hand is past feeling. No. This place is so evil, our torches give off no warmth. Which is ugh, ugh, cringe making. And Mighty Morphid Power Elf doesn't show any signs of being affected by said cold. She boldly and apparently warmly leads the way forward. And when asked how she knows they're going in the right direction, well, I noted that it was a fucking corridor, so there are only two directions they could go in, and one of them is backwards. But she explains It's colder than the rest. This after we've just been told that it's so cold no one can feel their own hands, and there is no heat at all because evil. I, uh, I don't care. So they go exploring and the place seems empty until Mighty Morphid Power Elf looks at a nondescript piece of ice and decides she can punch through it. It would have been really awkward if it was a wall behind there, but luckily it was a piece of ice concealing a doorway. So they smash through and they find another room with some orcs apparently melted into the walls. And oh my god, the fucking dialogue and the fucking acting, it's so bad. I just have to play it. What devilry is this? But what was their purpose? Surely it is lost to the ages now. Whatever happened here was long ago. Whatever happened here is long ago. I am an elf. That means I had my personality lobotomized. I'm told they use my voice to persuade people that euthanasia is a really good idea. And even, uh, even the physics is bad. They've been traveling in the freezing cold for who knows how long. They are in a place so evil that fire gives off no heat. Everything around them is frozen. They are frozen. But apparently they're drinking water in its bottles. Yeah, that's not frozen because that is immune to the cold, I suppose, for reasons. And Mighty Morphid Power Elf uses it to melt the ice on a random table, which reveals a mark of Sauron. Uh, th th this, is, this is not how anything works. Anyway, the mark leads Galadriel to conclude that it was left as a trail for orcs to follow, so they should follow it. Lest you think they had been following equivalent symbols forming a trail until this point, hence managing to get to the place they are now in, no. No. That, that would have made too much sense. Apparently, Mighty Morphin Power Elf hasn't seen the symbol since she first saw it carved into Hunky Brother's flesh, leaving you to wonder, A, how could she possibly have concluded that it was a trail given it's the only one she has seen since the first one. B. What other trail have they been following that led them here to begin with? And then C. Why would Sauron carve a trail mark into a dead body, her brother, that he must have known would be found by the elves and moved? None of this makes any fucking sense. They have another argument then about whether or not they should return home. Mighty Morphid Power Elf apparently misses the light of the trees and she yearns to see it too. Except that the trees were destroyed, remember, so so no. More exploring then follows, and then the writers assumed we'd gone far too long, we are 15 minutes into the episode and less than 10 minutes since the last battle, without an action sequence. And of course, we can't have the audience getting bored. So, suddenly, a snow troll, which fucks up Mighty Morphid Power Elf's team of seasoned, experienced, well-traveling, battle-hardened sidekicks, but, but which she dispatches with a smug, satisfied look. And I've said many times, I don't like the strong whammon line of criticism, but it's really, really hard to avoid it when shows insist on inviting it. This is not how you make people care about and admire your characters. Why the hell should we ever experience tension or a field of threat in any of Mighty Morphid Power Elf scenes if it's already established she can fuck up anyone and everything with ease? <sighs> Anyway, this episode provides the last straw for the Merry Men, who say Mighty Morphid Power Elf must go on alone. And then we get to the title slate. Christ, there's a long way to go. Better get another bottle in. The title slate says this is a Lord of the Rings show, which is a lie, because it has very little to do with it. Elsewhere in the world, two comically attired men are strolling around, and we meet a bunch of not-hobbits who are hiding from them. The not-hobbits are led by that guy from the Premier Inn adverts. 
For American viewers who are in the enviable position of not knowing who this is, his name is Lenny Henry, and besides advertising budget hotels, he has more recently redefined himself into the role of sometime social commentator with a particular emphasis on the evils and crimes of racism. However, before he was a social commentator and before he was a cheap flogger of budget hotels, he was, allegedly at least, a comedian. And at that time, well, shall we say, his anti-racist faculties were perhaps not quite so developed as they have become since. I include this here and simply invite the question, had a white man been doing this against an ethnic minority, especially, for example, a black person, would he have been so easily and so quickly forgiven, and would he now be finding himself in a starring role in a big-budget Amazon TV show? I will, for the avoidance of doubt, come on to my final solution to the race question at some point, either later in this video, or perhaps in the next one, if time does not permit me. But I just leave this clip here now for your delectation. They are an admirably diverse collection of gypsy-looking chaps and chapesses who speak with dodgy Irish accents, and they are vaguely charming and one of them is destined to be a main character. A small group of them, including main character, goes exploring looking for blackberries, and a child not hobbit finds a sinister-looking track in the mud. It transpires they are being stalked by an evil creature, a wolf of sorts, though this goes nowhere. Then, jumping another thousand miles across the world, we meet a young Ned Stark, who the show seems to think is Elrond. He is told that his friend, which we later learn is Mighty Morphid Power Elf, has arrived in Lindon, which is the capital in the lore of the Kingdom of Gil-galad. Mighty Morphid Power Elf has indeed arrived. Who knows how much time has passed, by the way, but she's managed to get all the way back from the far north in what seems to be very little time, but then again, because the elves don't age at all, kind of hard to tell. She shows young Ned the symbol that she found, and they have an argument about it. Mighty Morphid Power Elf defied the king's orders in continuing her search, but young Ned says the king is prepared to forgive her this time. She, though, wants an audience so she can nag the king about the symbol as well. Meanwhile, back with the Not Hobbits, the children make it back without being eaten by wolves. I assume that this is going to be set up for a later episode and the threats that main character Not Hobbit will encounter, because we never see it again in either of the two episodes that have been released so far. Main character's surname is Brandyfoot. I think we're just going to call her Brandy, which is now something I want to drink an awful lot of. And she longs to see the big wide world while her kin try to discourage her, and that's all depressingly predictable. You'd think with the wealth of material that does exist in the appendices and that they could have fashioned a tale from, from all that they might have been able to create something a bit more original than this. Meanwhile, back in Linden, the king, who is never named in either of these two episodes but is most definitely Gil-galad, is rewarding those who went searching for Sauron using some tortured metaphors. Washing away the last remnants of our enemy like a spring rain over the bones of a spoilt cock. And my metaphors flourish like the cheese on a nun's eyelid. They are as fragrant as the carpet on the ceiling of fish. There is a double tragedy here, of course. Not only is the metaphor tortured as hell, war crime level torture, but it's implied that Elrond has written it for him, because Elrond in this show is the aspiring politician. You see him mumbling the speech as Gil-galad gives it. But if you're going to try and write a character who is a competent politician and a fairly talented speechwriter, might be an idea, guys, if you actually had some talented speechwriting yourself, because if Elrond is proud of this line, he is a dick. He's of the opinion that the days of war are over. And he pointedly looks at Mighty Morphid Power Elf when he says the days of peace have begun. She chooses not to make a fuss about it at this juncture. So Gilgalad says their reward is to be shipped back to Valinor. Now it has been a while since I read this particular part of the Silmarillion, but I'm pretty sure Valinor is not Disneyland. It is not a place you can send the kids to as a reward for good behavior. It is well established, of course, that this show doesn't exist in the same universe, but since it is calling itself a Lord of the Rings show, I'm going to call this nonsense. The Noldor were exiled from Valinor, not least for the kinslaying. It wasn't until the coming of the Age of Men that the Valar agreed to let the Noldor return to the Undying Lands, as we movingly see depicted at the close of Return of the King. This is such a deracinated history. It's really quite astonishing. There is no depth to the story, the existence, and the history of the elves in this show. 
The point of the law is to create a grand mythos, a story and a theology and a morality that extends thousands of years into the past, back to creation itself. The story of the Noldor is a moral tragedy. Their history is tragic. Their eventual redemption is a payoff for thousands of years of history in exile. But here they just left Valinor one day, and there's no mention of the Valar, there's no mention of the Kinslaying, and they can arbitrarily choose to go back if the king decides they deserve to. This is an empty world by comparison to the one it claims as its own heritage. There's no life in it, there's no sense of purpose or memory. Anyway, young Ned and mighty Morphid Power Elf have another chat after the ceremony, and the ceremony has fireworks, meaning I guess that people have had access to and an understanding of gunpowder for thousands of years before the events of the Lord of the Rings, and nobody at any point until Saruman thought to do anything with this besides making fireworks. This isn't impossible, I suppose. The Romans invented the steam engine. It wasn't until the Industrial Revolution, centuries later, that the engine was put to industrial use by the English, but still... Still, we're living in a time of the dwarves at their height, and Keller Brimbor, the master smith and engineer. It does make all this a little bit implausible. Young Ned continues to try and dissuade Mighty Morphid Power Elf, but she insists that evil is still out there, and he hasn't seen what she has seen. She's toying with the idea of refusing the offer to return to Valinor, but he encourages her to go, and... <sighs> I mean, is there anything really to say about this scene? The dialogue, I suppose, is clunky and overly ornate. The framing is inevitably that Mighty Morphid Power Elf deserves to go because she's done so much and she's been so impeccably brilliant for so long. The acting is... Uh, passable? I guess it's slightly above the average of this show. But if we're going to feel anything for either of these characters, and especially for Mighty Morphid Power Elf, well, we need a lot more than this because we don't. We don't feel anything for her. Not really. Because nothing has been earned. The writers have decided to copy so many of their peers in presenting the boilerplate story of the perfect and far-seeing modern woman being discouraged by her short-sighted, backward and petty menfolk. And that's supposed to invite our sympathy and our respect and our understanding. Because we, like she, know that she is right. We're supposed to share in her frustration that nobody else can see what she can see. It's a shortcut into creating, and I will use the name this time, Galadriel as surrogate for the audience, she is the character we are meant to inhabit because we share her foreknowledge. But it doesn't work, because there isn't really a character to inhabit. There's no depth to her. We've been told in exposition what drives her and why, but even then it's shallow and formulaic. Her brother was killed, she wants revenge. Everything else about her is perfect. Looks to talents to power and skills, martial prowess, clear-sightedness. The tragedy of her background, which is the closest we can come to a flaw in her character, is one-dimensional, it's not even a flaw, because we already know that she's right about everything. And if it weren't already struggling for effect, the show has duplicated the setup in its first episode. Pretentious defenders of this writing might point to a poetic symmetry between Mighty Morphid Power Elf and Brandy over with the Not Hobbits, but poetic symmetry requires a higher purpose, and that's not been so much as hinted at in this episode. Instead, we've just got two characters from different backgrounds, but the same base drives, motives, and relationships with their respective communities. Unless a point's going to be made of it, and yeah, it might be, but there's not been any hint of it yet, there's no reason for two strong women stifled by the conventions of their respective societies and looking to rebel. Brandy's is, if anything, the more interesting story, if only because it's not so completely formed, and so contains more potential. The Mighty Morphid Power Elf is supposed to be the focal point of this show, and it's not usually a good sign when your secondary cast is more compelling because you've done nothing with them yet, than your protagonist is compelling because what you've done with her is boring. We get another Indiana Jones map sequence. There are several of these in this show, and then we're over with a village of, again, admirably diverse men, which is our introduction, not to the men as yet, but to a mysterious cowled figure with elvish clothes who turns out to be CNN's own Don Lemon. Don Lemon is an elvish wandering type from a nearby outpost. He's one of those who has been hailed because at long last there are elves of colour in fantasy. Ugh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm going to address that, but not quite yet. Although, fuck me, the show wants me to address it right now. Tolkien was, as mentioned, opposed to allegory. But one of the defining features of the modern writer is that absolutely everything, whether about the past or the present or the future, in a fantasy land or a science fiction universe or a children's fairy tale, must convey allegorical messages about the present. And in this case, the heavy subtext is contemporary claims of racism. Now, antipathy between the races, to use the term in another way, of Tolkien's world is well established. 
The dwarves and the elves do not typically get on, for example. There's a reason, though, for that. It's not merely racism as we would identify it in the modern world. It's partly their innate differentness. The elves are immortal, at least long-living. They are the firstborn. They were created by Iluvatar himself. They are also the first to arrive in Middle-earth, while the dwarves are created by one of the Valar, outside originally Iluvatar's plan. They are shorter-lived, they have different drives and motives, they live in different places, they value different things, they speak a different language. There is an innate differentness from the off between them. They actually start off trading on reasonably good terms, though the dwarves are slightly more appreciative of the elves than the elves are of the dwarves. It's not until the sack of Doriath that you really get the antipathy build. But that's a solid, non-allegorical, in-universe explanation for what you might choose to call racial antipathy. We've yet to see the dwarves in this show, but the first interaction between an elf and a man conveys antipathy of an entirely different, more contemporary, and more political kind. Because it's so transparently allegorical that it feels like you've just been punched in the nose by a woke version of Lurtz. Oh, let it go, knife ears. It's a bloody patch of grass. The lot you lump us in with died off a thousand years ago. When are you people gonna let the past go? I'm not objecting to the knife ears jibe, because that makes some sense in-universe, it needn't be read allegorically, but when the angry white teenage male brat in the bar confronts Don Lemon and bitterly asks, when are you people going to let the past go, a line delivered not only to an elf but to a black man, well how the fuck else are we supposed to read this? Angry young white man frustrated that black people won't let go of past transgressions? Yeah, yeah I'm pretty sure that's a fucking allegory. And hell, you're pretty well invited to read it even more specifically than a contemporary racism allegory, because when angry young white man further confronts Don Lemon, he says, One day, our true king will return and pry us right out from under your pointy boots. Uh, well, firstly, that's a shit insult, my dude. Pointy boots? The fucker's footwear got to do with the elves. Is this it? Is this all you can conjure, Saruman? But secondly, Angry young man resentful of black people bringing up the past and who longs for his true king to free them of the tyranny of the minorities? Well, if that isn't a Trump-inspired Democrat talking point, I'm straight. So here we have a second significant betrayal of the point and purpose of Tolkien. Having discarded the world and much of the law, now we discard the purpose and the method. To eschew politics and messaging and allegory and point scoring, to uphold the innate value of escapism against these same things. The point of the Lord of the Rings, the point of all the best and most universally and eternally appreciable works of fiction and film is precisely their universal aspect. By foregoing partisan and contemporary politicking, they are something anyone and everyone of whatever age, racial background, gender, sexual persuasion, hair color, fucking shoe size can come to love. Hell, the diverse cast and crew of this very show say they appreciate that about Tolkien in the first place. Why else would it be so important for them to be represented in it if they didn't already love the thing they are now in? But as with the Bezos example from my introduction, these are people who love the product but have no true or deep understanding of what it is, of what made it, or of why it's loved, what its moral and societal purpose and function is. It's universally loved because it is universal. Rings of Power will not be universally loved because it is proudly particular. It has been created by, and it has cast, and it has been made for an audience that wants specific ownership of a common property. Forgetting why they themselves came to love it in the first place, they've set out to ensure only they and their friends and collaborators can love it. For all the complaints we constantly hear about gatekeeping in popular culture, this is the most pervasive and insidious form of gatekeeping. The barbarians, having hammered at the gates, have been let in, and now they're busily dumping anyone and everyone who doesn't share their precise political views out of the city and closing the gates again. Unless you think as I do, they say, you cannot be admitted to this city. You are not a Tolkien fan, they say, unless you agree with what we've done. What the fuck is this if it isn't gatekeeping? And for the avoidance of doubt, no, this isn't any kind of great replacement metaphor I'm going for here. This isn't black people or women or the big gay infiltrating a fan base and pushing out straight white men. It's just coincidental that straight white men are the largest excluded demographic. This is quite specifically political exclusion. Black people, women, and gays have loved Tolkien for decades, and their love for Tolkien has never entailed closing Tolkien off to anyone else. It's a specific political faction that has claimed association with these groups and has used that claimed association to justify its own gatekeeping. 
Well, as someone who takes at least one of these minority boxes, fuck you. You do not speak for me. And your attempts to represent me have driven me out of what was once a shared property. I don't care if you, in my audience here, supports Trump or Biden or Bernie. We can have fun arguments about that another time. I don't care if you have a penis or a vagina. I don't care if you're down with the gays or think we're all a bit icky. I don't care if you're a Muslim or a Christian or a fucking Jedi. If you like Tolkien, we have something in common. We have something we can share. And in sharing it, we can forget about our differences for a while. Universality is the bedrock of society. And yet here, Rings of Power is attempting to particularize, and so to balkanize the fanbase, and then to cast anyone outside its own political in-group as an irredeemable bigot who cannot be admitted to the kingdom. Sincerely, and bitterly, fuck the people who are doing this. Fuck them. Fuck them to hell. This is insulting. I would go so far as to say this is a bigger betrayal than the abandonment of the law is. But I'm still going to do the race thing later, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I'll do it later. Anyway, Don Lemon is the better man. Or the better elf, if you prefer. He defends angry young white man when the bartender goes to sock him. And then we're fast-forwarded through his own character history and values. And we see him making sweet, sweet discourse with his forbidden love. If I had to guess, this is going to be the show's hollow attempt at recreating the tale of Beren and Luthien, mirrored by Aragorn and Arwen, star-crossed in the first instance and semi-forbidden in the second, and doomed in both accounts of love between men and elves. Both of these examples conveyed the idea, the complexities, the tragic implications, with a sense of poetic tragedy and feeling. But Rings of Power has not shown itself capable of rising to that task, or indeed anywhere near it. Also, all the time and effort that's been expended recreating a real-seeming world of its day, the sets, the costume design, but for inexplicable reasons, they didn't think to do the same thing with something so simple as characters' hairstyles. I didn't know there were high-class expensive salons in Middle-earth, there weren't any in the Jackson films, but every one of these characters, except perhaps the not-hobbits, is looking exceptionally fly. And though I wouldn't cite it as a significant flaw, I would say it's a little bit distracting. It does detract from the realism. It actually does damage to your immersion, because it reminds us that these are actors and not people. Actors, of course, are not people. By and large, they are cretins. But in the context of dramatic immersion, being reminded you are watching actors is never a good thing. Anyway, the message from the High King reaches them, they are going to abandon their local outpost because the war is officially over, and it's officially peacetime now. Which matters, of course, because it means Don Lemon and his wench will be separated. Aren't we sad? Oh, we aren't sad? They haven't given us any reason to be sad yet? Oh well, writing is hard. The show attempts to make us feel something for it in the next scene, where Don Lemon visits... Uh, I, I don't actually know what her name is. I don't care either. He visits her at home, he tries to tell her he loves her, he says he's said it in everywhere but words, but he can't say it in words. But then she's called away by a visitor at the front door who wants her to heal his cow. A silly aside, you might think? No. No, 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 this is a very significant cow. This is perhaps the most significant of all the cows. And it has a very significant sickness. Its milk is black. The cow came from the east. Cows getting sick in the east is apparently very significant. So Don Lemon and What's-Her-Name are suddenly seized with a very pressing need to go and investigate. <sighs> a peculiar phenomenon in modern film is the way it redeems earlier entries that were widely considered at the time to be, shall we say, subpar? Like the Star Wars sequels, which have filled everyone with a new and I think at least partly justified appreciation for the prequels. I never thought I'd say this, but Rings of Power is making The Hobbit look good. That's really saying something, because The Hobbit is fucking awful. But the show is borrowing liberally from its devices. For example, the spreading sickness in nature is used in The Hobbit to tease the presence of Sauron at Dol Guldur. And the discovery of ancient weapons like the Morgul blade Gandalf finds is likewise used to drive the narrative towards Sauron's realization. We get to one of these scenes in Rings of Power as well. Rings of Power uses both of these devices in short order. Significant sick cow, followed by child discovering sword hilt with Sauron's symbol on it. But The Hobbit did both of these much better. In the first instance, the sickness is portrayed as widespread, and Radagast is already in the business of investigating it. It leaves a much clearer and less ambiguous trail that doesn't require a leap of the imagination, by the audience or by the characters involved, to justify the conclusion they reach. Rings of Power, by contrast, doesn't give us much more than a sick cow. There is a snippet of a conversation earlier when Don Lemon enters the pub, he overhears a mention of poison, but that is dismissed at the time as insignificant hearsay. The sick cow is supposed to be a kind of payoff, but the build-up is all but non-existent. 
It's still an implausible leap from vague mention of poison to sick cow to sudden and urgent need to investigate terrible evil. And instantly, serious music starts, urgency is applied, the hunt is on. It's a sick fucking cow. You sick fucking cows. In the second place, the discovery of the Morgul Blade is likewise part of an entire subplot in The Hobbit that reaches a conclusion, meaning the audience knows and agrees with Gandalf's diagnosis of events. Though completely invented by the film, none of it happens in the book, it is at least internally consistent, it doesn't contradict the other events of the film. By contrast, in Rings of Power, Child just randomly stumbles across a hilt in an abandoned barn, and this does at least threaten to contradict the rest of the show, because Galadriel has hunted for centuries and never found one of these symbols, until arriving at the Northern Fortress. The fix to this is so fucking simple. These symbols form a trail the show wants us to believe. Single instances are not trails. You need multiple symbols in order for them to constitute a trail. The symbols are otherwise opaque and their purpose is unknown, and, as in the case of the sword, they are left on seemingly insignificant items and objects. Finally, we need a reason for Mighty Morphid Power Elf to have gone to the Northern Fortress in the first place, or even to know of its existence. So, the fix. Mighty Morphid Power Elf has found many of these symbols. The nature and meaning of the symbols is disputed, and their significance is largely rejected and dismissed by her superiors as being mere clan markings or flags of allegiance used in the Old War, nothing more than that. Her belief that they are more significant leads her to suspect that they are a trail, so she finds several of them. We can hear about this in background story if we want to, or voiceover, but her finding of several such symbols leads her toward the Northern Fortress. Problem solved, but problem also avoided. Because when Random Child finds a symbol, it then doesn't clash with her own established mechanics, and the fact that she, in this telling, has only seen two of these symbols in centuries of looking. It more satisfyingly explains her surety of purpose and direction, as well as the fact other people might occasionally stumble across these symbols. But, uh, nah, writing is hard. Meanwhile, Mighty Morphid Power Elf is on the ship heading back to the portal, yes, it is a fucking portal, don't at me, to Valinor, and they've been travelling for who knows how long, but they all stand rigidly, in full armour. Mind you, elves are very light on their feet, so maybe they just don't get tired. That's a little bit of silliness. But for some major silliness, I invite you to consider the next scene between young Ned and Gil-galad. Gil-galad explains... Uh, bear with me on this one. It's gonna sound incredibly fucking dumb, but I am just the messenger. Gil-galad explains that he sent Mighty Morphid Power Elf away, and it's for the best that he sent her away. Because if she goes around looking for Sauron, she might, um... <laughs> She might actually find him, and that would be bad. This is the actual reason that's given. Don't believe me? Well, I present you exhibit... I think we're up to exhibit Q in the list of significant nonsense. She might have inadvertently kept alive the very evil she sought to defeat. Or the same wind that seeks to blow out a fire may also cause its spread. So, just to delay this out, Gil-galad thinks he even knows that there is a vast evil power out there. But that's fine. And he sent away Mighty Morphid Power Elf because he didn't want her to come across the vast evil power she also knows is out there. Because despite there being a massive evil power gathering its forces, actually finding that to stop it, that would be that would be bad. That would that would make you think that would blah? Blah? I don't understand. Why is this? What are you... What is it doing? Did no one look at the script and ask any questions at all? We're going to have the king send Galadriel away for reasons. Okay, why? That's all it would have taken. That's it. One fucking question. And this entire scene, set up and payoff, explodes. The thing is... It's also entirely unnecessary. You don't need to do any of this. There are so many other ways that do not require Olympic stupidity to sustain them. And remember, this isn't any old king being this unmentionably fucking dumb. This is Gil-galad. This is THE Gil-galad. This is the guy who ruled almost all the elves of Middle-earth at one point. Respected by everyone. Long-lived, experienced, general, fearsome warrior, wise, powerful. He's the guy who formed the last alliance that fought against Sauron. But here... Here he's portrayed as fucking Denethor, complacent, corrupt, fearful, and short-sighted. At least with Denethor there's a reason for it. He genuinely was fearful. 
He'd been corrupted by the visions he saw through the Palantir, a man who had been driven to doom and despair by what Sauron had shown him through the stone. But there's no reason for Gil-galad to act and think like this, except that the show needs it to happen so it can move Mighty Morphid Power Elf somewhere else and show how brilliant she is against the stifling conformity of the stupid men. Because writing is hard. Anyway, he wants to move the show along, so he asks young Ned if he's heard of Celebrimbor. Of course, he's heard of Celebrimbor, but the show isn't confident the viewers have, so it commits one of those lazy sins of bad writing, unnecessary exposition. Have you heard of Celebrimbor, the greatest of the elven smiths, Elrond says, laughing at how ridiculous the question is. Yes, of course he's heard of him. He's admired him since he was a child. If he is the greatest of elven smiths, Gil-galad had no need to ask that question, and young Ned has no need to tell Gil-galad that he is the greatest of elven smiths, because both characters already know this, because he is the greatest of elven smiths. Again, completely unnecessary. Again, a very simple fix. Celebrimbor's purpose and nature can be shown to us when we fucking meet him. Have Gil-galad simply explain why he wants young Ned to seek him out, and we already learn why it becomes necessary to seek him out, with subsequent details filled in at the point of their meeting. Treat your audience with a bit of fucking respect, you creepy little goblins. Celebrimbor is about to embark on a new project, it is explained, so we already know what the question was, Ugh. and young Ned is supposed to work with him. And then Celebrimbor himself turns up in person, just as finely quaffed as every other rejected model, I mean actor, in the civilized parts of this world. Speaking of the civilized parts of the world, we're away from those now and back with Lenny Henry and Brandy, as he tells her she is too curious and meddlesome. I think, being serious and complimentary for a change, these are the most effective segments in the show. The characters are the most believable, they are the most charming, the most free of pretensions. Speaking of pretensions, however, we're back with Don Lemon and, um, uh, this, her, this one, um, whatever, whatever she is. Anyway, there's some exposition that we don't really need or remember, and they get back to their weird and horrifically earnest flirting, which is then interrupted when they spot some black smoke that they should have seen from miles away and the burning wreckage of a village. After another Indiana Jones map sequence, we find Mighty Morphid Power Elf and the elves are still standing at attention on their ship. They have come a long way now, and then some women appear to take their armor off them and they sail toward the sun. Mighty Morphid Power Elf is reluctant to let go her dagger because she is very strong and she is a warrior, but she eventually relents. Some birds fly out of the sun. There is some pretty quiet music, which reminds me that I haven't noticed the soundtrack since the beginning of the show, which is again a shame, given what Howard Shaw accomplished and what McCreary is tasked with emulating. Then the Bifrost opens up and they get a vision of Asgard. No, no, the portal opens up and they see the light of Valinor. But Mighty Morphid Power Elf's hunky brother does a Ben Kenobi then and speaks the line from the beginning about stones and ships. And she looks at her dagger, which has just been kind of left around on the floor of the boat rather than being taken away and stored, which is dumb but convenient, a line that explains an awful lot that happens in Rings of Power. The scenes begin to flash back and forth from boat to a meteor in the sky, in the latter of which we see more of the world, including Ents. Gilgalad sees the fiery meteor shoot across the sky, and that is significant. The music tells us so. Back on the ship, Mighty Morphid Power Elf decides after a flashback to Hunky Brother, fuck it, I do not want to go to heaven today, and so she jumps off the ship at the moment the meteor crashes to earth. The Bifrost closes, it leaves her in darkness, and in the middle of the ocean, just bobbing about, hundreds, even thousands of miles from land. So, she's dead. Gilgalad picks up a leaf, the leaf dies in his hand, you see blackness spread through its veins. While elsewhere, we learn that the meteor has crashed near the Not Hobbits, and Brandy finds a homeless man lying in the middle of the crash site. And that is the end of episode one. So we move on to episode two, which begins with Mighty Morphin Power Elf still bobbing about in the ocean where she will surely die. She'll get cold, she might be eaten by sharks, she'll drown. There's absolutely no way she can be saved. She is far too far away to have any hope of swimming back to shore. So she goes to swim back to shore for fuck's sake. Now, if you had recourse to the actual law, you could have found an explanation for this decision. Ulmo, for instance, is the Valar who has stewardship of the water, and he is known to influence the course of events in Middle-earth, even, if my memory serves, after the Valar retreat into Valinor, popping up occasionally over the course of the First and Second Ages, where there has been a pressing need for his assistance. 
You could have had Mighty Morphin Power Elf try and swim, swim until she can't swim anymore, and realize she is going to die, then calling out to the Valar she has just rejected, showing remorse for having so rejected them, to have her prayers then, so to speak, answered by Ulmo, who could engineer her safe return to Middle-earth in any number of ways. This would have added to the lore as presented in show. It would also have added to Mighty Morphid Power Elf's character, depth, sincerity, gratitude, connection with the world, etc. But nah, let's just have her swim hundreds or thousands of miles. She'll be fine. She'll probably make it back in five minutes. It's easy for her because she is strong and stunning and brave and heroic. This is exactly what we like to see in our characters. Flaws and imperfections? Nah, that's for pussies. You go, girl. Back with Brandy at the meteor crash site, genuinely not a sentence I ever expected to utter about a Lord of the Rings related show, she's joined by a pudgy friend who accidentally pushes her into the fiery hole. But she's fine, to the point of actually touching the scalding hot wreckage of the meteor and climbing on it, and she doesn't melt. She pokes a homeless man that's lying in the center and he wakes up and he grabs her. Now if the rumors are to be believed, the show is going to try and have us think that the homeless man is Gandalf. But of course it can't be Gandalf, because Gandalf doesn't arrive in Middle-earth until the Third Age, so we are going to call him Steve. Steve grabs Brandyford and has a shout, then he does an Obi-Wan Kenobi and lifts the rocks using the Force which puts the fires out, and then he goes back to sleep, and then the fires reignite, but Brandy remains untorched. She and Podge decide not to tell the folks at home, but to try and carry Steve away anyway. Lenny Henry, who is actually almost good in this show, because the Not Hobbits are the only likable bunch we've seen so far, he decides that the tribe or the clan should stay where they are despite the meteor having dropped, because they'll be safer in camp than if they try to move away. Meanwhile, Brandy and Podge, the detective duo you didn't know you needed, have summoned a wagon from somewhere and are wheeling Steve back to camp. And this is an excuse for them to hammer home again that Brandy is bold and adventurous and she feels smothered by her small-minded kin. Because the show can't really decide what it is at this point, just two episodes in, the wagon wheels away down the hill with Steve passed out like a skunked up hobo, and this is actually very funny. Maybe not quite in the way the show probably wishes it was, but it is quite funny nonetheless. But they catch him and get him back to camp somehow and they hide him in a tent and we have another argument between her and Podge about how different and ambitious and bold and adventurous she is. This is messy. This is inefficient writing. We already know all of this. It's been said repeatedly, time and time and time again. In fact, we've learned and we've relearned it in every single one of Brandy's scenes so far. The audience is not that stupid, dammit. We don't need this. Though I sometimes think, when we assume the writers are playing us for fools, we don't consider the more likely explanation. The writers themselves are fools. They're just treating us as they need to treat each other. Back with Don Lemon and... Uh, her... This one, fuck it, I still don't know what her name is. They're investigating the burned village, and Don Lemon is wearing his There has been a terrorist attack on a gay club expression. As he goes about among the ruins and the dead animals looking for... Well, they were looking for the origin of the sick cow, but I guess we've moved on now to more pressing matters. And they discover a hole in the ground that could not have been dug by a man. He tells her to go and warn her people and says he will explore the tunnel. She points out that he doesn't know what's down there and the response is Ugh. That is the reason I must go. Writing is hard, especially dialogue apparently. This weighty self-serious bilge is just trying. It's so self-conscious. You can put yourself in the mind of the writer as they sat at their keyboard thinking, I must make this sound very important. It isn't, it's stilted, it's awkward, it's overly self-serving. They share a wistful parting look, and the audience is already in the position of saying, just fuck already? Because the show really wants us to feel something about this relationship, and we just don't, it's so forced. Across the world then, again, we arrive at a region with a young Ned and Celebrimbor. And here it becomes very transparent that the writers are sourcing from the appendices, because the bits of the lore they pick and choose have so obviously been selected for their immediate effect to give the impression of depth to the world. But they are just as obviously divorced from the context the appendices cannot always provide, but the Silmarillion could. So we see Fëanor's hammer, 
and we're told that this was the tool that created the Silmarils, which the show then decides are the Light of Valinor. Having forgotten that the Light of Valinor was actually the trees, and the Silmarils are in a sense derivations, albeit, and crucially, derivations more beautiful than that from which they were derived, which is part of the origin of Melkor or Morgoth's lust for them. Their context is the origin for the war at the beginning of episode 1, which the show does as much as it can to retroactively explain, but because they've been chosen here largely for superficial reasons, no real connection has been or will be made, making it essentially pandering to the audience, a bid to trick those who've never read the book into believing the world has more depth than it really does, and those who have read the books, but who are too desperate to buy content, that the show actually respects the lore it's citing, which it quite obviously does not. We hear of Morgoth and his tears falling on the Silmarils, his appreciation of them, but not why any of this happened or why it really mattered or what it led to. The Silmarillion's account is too long to properly render in this video, but it encompasses decades, battles, multiple myths and stories, including that of Beren and Luthien. While in Rings of Power, what we understand of events is that Feanor made the Silmarils and they were nice and Morgoth liked them. Don't get me wrong, it is nice to have the mention. It is a start, but it's been earned with a sacrifice, that sacrifice being the perverting, Melkor-like, of the story this show claims is part of its lineage. Celebrimbor compares himself unfavourably with Feanor, and sets out his plans to create the most powerful forge in the world. But he wants it created by the spring, which requires more workers than they can reasonably expect to find among the elves, leading young Ned to suggest seeking partners from other races. Which is how, fingers firmly on the fast-forward button, we end up at Khazad Doom meeting the dwarves. It's odd that the show will, in one place, take much more time than it should, like repeating Brandy's arguments with her place in the world, while in others, it is so overtly trying to rush events along. This leads to a clunkiness and a kind of stupidity. For example, Keller Brimbor explains that Gil-galad cannot provide him with the workforce needed for this project, so he has sent him young Ned instead. You might be wondering, why? He should not be wondering why. He should have a pretty good idea why he's been given young Ned instead of even half a team of actual workers, because if he didn't understand the reason for that, the fact of it would make no sense to him and he would justifiably be quite pissed off about things. But young Ned's suggestion that they look to other races seems to come as a complete surprise to Celebrimbor, as though he's never even considered it before. Now it's possible at this stage that he does know what and why, and he's just being coy and a bit to encourage young Ned, or perhaps for some other reason. That will be something to keep an eye on. Likewise, the stated need to have the project completed by the spring, for which no reason has yet been given. Both of these things really do need to be addressed for sense to retroactively be applied to this scene. I think the spring aspect will be addressed, but I doubt if we will ever learn more about the first question, and that just makes Celebrimbor an oddly detached moron. Cue another Indiana Jones map sequence. And they arrive at Moria, of course in these days known as Khazad Doom, where Celebrimbor explains that an alliance with the dwarves would be a real achievement. And this poses law questions. The elves and the dwarves should be much more hostile to each other by this point in time, because much of their antipathy dates back to the sacking of Doriath late in the First Age, prior to which they had been on reasonably good trading terms if cold personal terms. Actual Galadriel, if memory serves, gets passage through Khazad Doom when she leaves Valinor for Middle-earth. Here though, the state of affairs is more muddled. Young Ned is good friends with Durin, we're told, and the dwarves of Moria, or Khazad Doom, are portrayed as being quite open to the elves, at least by Ned's account. That's until the show does an absurdly obvious Star Wars reference that's actually, and again I think unintentionally, funny. And enough malt beer to fill the Arduin. What you want? It is Elrond of Lindon. We seek an audience with Prince Durin. No. Look familiar? Might be dozen. <laughs> I don't think they're going to let us in, Artur. So Elrond persists, and he invokes a right to smash rocks for social acceptance. Totally a thing. He leaves Celebrimbor at the door and is invited inside, where we get our first look at an inhabited Moria, which... Well, okay, it's impressive in a way. But it's also a little bit underwhelming, maybe because they're trying to show us too much and have re-encountered that problem with CGI and scale we described earlier. Compare these two scenes and just which is the most affecting of them. Both. The great realm and dwarf city of Dwarodelf. We think that comparison speaks for itself, I'm not going to go hard on Rings of Power for this, because I think it does understand the point, 
and why people really should want to see this place in the fullness of its glory. It's just that the scene doesn't land, but at least the intent was good. The dwarves are themselves a little bit too much like the Hobbit's slightly cartoonish depiction for my taste. The justification given in interviews is that dwarves are supposed to be eccentric and gregarious, and dialed up. I don't really see the need for this in a serious show. Jackson's films manage to portray this much more subtly and believably. But anyway, they start smashing rocks. It's an endurance test. The first one to fail is a pussy and gets exiled or something. We jump across then to Brandy and Steve, who has woken up, and he fancies another shout. Every time he shouts, he affects the weather. And though the show thinks it's being coy by not telling us this is Gandalf, it is very obviously supposed to be Gandalf. Not least because they mimic the trick he deploys to scare Bilbo into handing over his property in the Fellowship of the Ring. If you're willing to forgive the fact that they are pretending they have a Gandalf when they don't and can't have a Gandalf, the depiction is… well, again I see the intent behind it. It is supposed to be a little bit jarring, it's supposed to be otherworldly. After all, he's only just arrived. He has no understanding of or familiarity with his surroundings, and apparently he lacks the ability to speak. Or perhaps these things were just knocked out of him when he crashed to earth on a meteor and incurred a mild concussion. So if we park the fact that it isn't Gandalf, does this work? Well, on balance, I think it kind of does. And it's another example of Brandy being given all the most interesting material, since she's the one undergoing the most revelatory and relevant world-building experiences, still couched in that kind of rustic detachment of irrelevance to the wider world that makes the Shire so endearing. I'd say it works until the point where she tries to teach him to speak, because then the show invokes a peculiar mix of Tarzan and Planet of the Apes as Steve struggles to communicate, but again, trying hard to be kind, at least the setup is intriguing enough. And the interplay between these two, it does have some potential. It inverts Brandy's position as ignorant novice by pairing her with someone even more ignorant of the world than she is. Steve starts drawing a symbol in the dirt, while back at the not-hobbit's camp, some kind of a disaster is unfolding and a tent collapses. The symbol, or the symbols he's drawing, are his attempt to communicate, and he gets frustrated when he doesn't understand. Then Podge arrives and informs Brandy that her father got injured when the tent collapsed. She frets that she should have been there, though why and what she could have done about it is unclear. The injury, however, poses issues for the camp, as Lenny Henry tactfully points out when he says that it means they might not be able to migrate, meaning they will presumably be stuck there longer than they wish to be. Now, you'll have to take my word for this when I say I'm scripting all this during my first watch. I don't actually know what comes next, but allow me the indulgence of a little prediction. I think they will indeed be stuck at the camp. And because they get stuck at the camp, something bad will happen. Probably something Steve was trying to tell Brandy about with his symbols. And as a result, everyone will die, leading Brandy to have a crisis of faith, but be forced off on her journey by virtue of the fact that her home has been destroyed. That is such an obvious thing to do that I'd really be surprised if the writers don't do it. And I'm leaving this section in the script even if I'm proved wrong, which I'm pretty sure I won't be. Across the world, Mighty Morphid Power Elf is still swimming. Fuck knows how long it's been. She should be dead. There is still no land in sight, and then she hears a noise. She draws her dagger. But it turns out the noise is a random raft that just happens to be floating around out here for no discernible reason, and just happens to float by her in this precise patch of sea at this precise time she needs it. How very lucky. There is an argument amongst the people on the raft about whether to let her on, but in the end they relent and admit her and give her some water to revive her. She's joined a motley and bedraggled crew who ask her why she's out there, the same question could just as well be asked of them, but isn't. They, though, fill in the gaps for us. Apparently, they set out a couple of weeks back and were attacked by a worm. This is another one of those fast-forward moments that hopes you don't stop and pay too close attention to what's going on. Happily, though, that's what I'm here for. Leaving aside the incomprehensible luck that the raft just happened to be floating in the precise place in the ocean at the precise time Mighty Morphid Power Elf happened to be swimming by, and leaving aside that she isn't dead of exhaustion, thirst, drowning or being eaten by sharks, we've just been introduced to a collection of randoms who've been attacked at some point by a worm. The randoms hate elves because they don't trust them. They expect to see other ships, but they don't like seeing other ships because they might be corsairs and the corsairs might kidnap, kill and skin them. This is an awful lot of brand new information introduced in a single scene, most of it to pad out a single relevant event. Mighty Morphid Power Elf's meeting with another of this show's various vaguely hunky men with whom she's going to strike up some kind of relationship in future. There is a word for just making shit up whenever you need a specific scene to happen or a specific character to be in a specific place at a specific time, stuff that will never come up again. It's called contrivance, and this entire segment is built on one. And then another one. And then another one. The ship they see coming toward them 
turns out to be their ship, the one the raft left from, but that turns out to be sitting on top of the worm, which comes to fuck them up. <sighs> I'm scripting this now at 5.30 in the morning. I've had a very long week. So I have to ask, is it just me, or does none of this make any fucking sense? Am I just losing my mind? Or have, within the space of 60 seconds, we just been randomly thrust into Middle Earth's equivalent of Jaws 4? Hunk tells them all to stand still, I guess the worm operates along the lines of the T-Rex from Jurassic Park, and it duly swims past them, and they all turn around to watch it go, but they forget that it has a tail which clips them as it passes. They being a superstitious bunch, the woman who saved Mighty Morphid Power Elf earlier decides that Mighty Morphid Power Elf is the reason Cthulhu's freaky fish guy has come to kill them, so she pushes Mighty Morphid Power Elf into the water again. She decides to swim away from the raft, and we see the worm destroy the raft, which leaves her bobbing about aimlessly again. Then a filter is put on the camera, and everything slows down, and… well, why? W what is this accomplishing? But then, from the mist, on another raft, Hunk arrives, and he rescues her. Uh, this is just very, 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 very fucking silly. He just sails out of the mist and picks her up, and then they both act as though they haven't just been attacked by Cthulhu's pet fish, and as though it isn't still in their near vicinity, and as though everyone they know hasn't just been killed, and they just casually introduce themselves and paddle off. Now, being as fair as I possibly can be, in the scene where the raft is destroyed, you can see, in the corner of the screen, Hunk detach his bit of the raft before the Cthulhu monster attacks him. But are you really telling me that he was far enough away here to avoid Cthulhu's massive gay fish? No, no, he definitely fucking wasn't. He's dead. Or he should be dead. But we can't go subjecting main characters to things like death, especially not when there's a good chance they could be very main characters indeed. Now, I've tried a few times in the course of this video to put myself in the minds of the writers, but when I try for this scene, I find myself in a void, all vast and black and empty. There is really no explaining this scene. It just, well, I mean, it happened, and we just sort of have to accept that it makes absolutely no fucking sense. And indeed, it seems to be allergic to sense. It has a magic barrier over it that rejects sense. Because writing is hard. However long, later, and far away, young Ned is still smashing rocks in a bid to make the dwarves respect him, but he gives up because he isn't Scottish, and nobody smashes inanimate objects like the Scots. Just ask Count Dankula. Jiren, who is supposed to be his friend, is in fact a total dick and wants to see the back of him, but young Ned asks him to escort him to the exit, which he agrees to do, and then they have an argument. The reason Jiren is unhappy is that Ned missed his wedding and the birth of his children. It's been 20 years since their last meeting. And actually, actually, this scene has some merits. The point, as Jiren makes it, is that 20 years might be the blink of an eye for an elf, but for a dwarf it's much of a lifetime. Ned has been absent in the most important personal moments of Jiren's life, and that is not what a friend would do. I genuinely don't mind this. It actually does convey a meaningful point. The fundamental difference in outlook between elves, who are as good as immortal, and the rest of the peoples of Middle-earth. The difficulties encountered in relations that result. Think, say, Elrond's bleak description to Arwen of the results of her marriage to Aragorn, which in the end sees her give up immortality for love. You can, if you work hard, just about work this into something like a law-consistent-ish position. The elves and the dwarves haven't known about each other for that long, especially in the mind of an elf so young Ned's mistake is profound as a learning experience. Of course, you can easily pick that apart. They might not have been together that long, but long enough for these basic differences to be understood. But on balance, the scene is quite good, at least until Ned comes to apologise. Because we've just dwelt for some minutes on something not technically relevant to the plot, the show wants to hit fast forward again. So Ned's apology is brief and thoroughly unemotional. Congratulations on your wife, your children. I hope you can come to forgive me. And Durin just accepts it and takes Ned to meet the wife, whereupon we play the entire preceding scene for comedy. One apology to Disa and you're off. No getting better acquainted. No reminiscing about the past and absolutely no staying for dinner. Yeah. Well, it was good while it lasted. The wife is Disa. I'm still doing the race thing later. She and Durin play off each other pretty well, in fact. Like the not hobbits, they are charming in their own way. They are the most vividly portrayed and colourful of the entire cast. The summary of the difference is, these people actually have a personality. Nobody else in the show does. Not Mighty Morphid Power Elf, not Ned, not Gil-Galad, not Don Lemon. 
The writers have taken a bit too much inspiration from The Hobbit's depictions, but they've also harked back, at least in some aspects, to Gimli's portrayal in The Lord of the Rings. And the mix is, well, it's nice enough, actually. The actors seem to have chemistry, which is, again, not something that can be said about anybody else in the show. After some cheerful back and forth, there's another brief flare-up of the argument, and, once again, this is played quite effectively. Durin has planted a tree given him by Ned many years ago, and this portrayal is pleasant, it's nice, it's actually feelingly done, it's quite meaningful. It portrays, with reasonable tact, the torture of a broken friendship, the things you keep from it, the innate desire to mend it. But then young Ned delivers a fucking atrocious line and undoes all of that hard work. Where there is love, it is never truly dark. Cringe, cringe, fucking cringe, stop it now. Ned goes to leave, but Durin relents and lets him present Celebrimbor's plan. Back in the ocean, where Mighty Morphid Power Elf is still miraculously undead, either from thirst or exhaustion or the Cthulhu monster, an awkward and soulless relationship is brewing between she and the latest hunk. They're both standoffish, and he randomly deduces that she was running to or from something. We learn that orcs chased him from his homeland, and we get another fiery flash of Sauron's symbol. Peter Jackson cannot sue, alas. This, though, does invite back some of the questionable world-building in the first episode. You'll remember we were told that orcs had spread all across the world and were building their forces. But then in the next sentence, we were told that Mighty Morphid Power Elf and her Merry Men had been scouring the Earth for centuries without seeing a single orc, leading the elves to just kind of forget about Sauron. Popping back to this script after watching episode 3, I can say that this issue recurs with much greater potency later on. But suffice it for now to say that the elves can't have been looking all that hard given that orcs are, in fact, quite a common occurrence all over the fucking place, including, as we will find out in the next episode, right beside an elvish watchtower. Anyway, Mighty Morphid Power Elf wants to know where he's from, and he won't tell her. And there is an incredibly forced argument based on absolutely no established relationship that ends with him insulting her by listing all of her perfect qualities. Will, pride, awesomeness. You're brilliant, but your brilliance can't help bring back my people in the kingdom you just randomly said you could reclaim for no good reason, you perfect fucker you. God, I hate how strong and awesome and pretty and talented you are, you bitch. Damn it, you're just so intelligent and lovely and skillful, you absolute c I'm really growing to hate Mighty Morphid Power Elf, if you haven't already guessed. She wants him to tell her where he's from, so she can go there and kill the orcs and find Sauron, but he refuses to tell her, because... reasons? He has his own plans, apparently. <sighs> Fuck me, we're in the veritable ocean of contrivance. It's like it's its own realm of existence where implausibly convenient stuff just happens every 30 seconds. Their meeting, the attack of Cthulhu Monster, their survival on respawnable rafts, the disappearance of Evil Fish Guy, the random argument they have that just happens to contain the bare minimum amount of information needed to progress the plot, but which has all the emotion and feeling of an established relationship, and now, suddenly, a storm. More peril. Yay. Back on the land. Um, ugh. This, this one. Don Lemon's beard, that one. She runs home and she warns her villagers about the destroyed village next door and the fact the tunnel they found is being dug toward their home. But nobody listens to her, because men never listen to the women in any modern media. They always end up dying as a result. Elsewhere, a man-child with a very strange voice gets angry at the floor and smashes it, only for an eye to peer out at him. And regretfully, I do have to say a word on this... Well, he's not a character, really, but this person... He is the kid who found the sword hilt in the last episode, the first toy from the show's big old mystery box. He's also the son of... what's her name? So fittingly, I don't know his name either. He's a very good example of the show's narrative being so spread out that each constituent part of it is so thin as to be barely even noticeable. Why is he angry at the floor? Well, we heard a single line in episode 1 about his father having left. I wouldn't blame you if you'd missed it because it immediately precedes the much more important and relevant discovery of the Sword Hilt. But then, the Sword Hilt is implied, and much more heavily implied later in this episode, to exercise some kind of psychically corrupting power itself. So, is he angry with his absent father and his general existence? Or is he angry that he was the only character not allowed into the expensive hair salon? Or is he angry from proximity to the Sword Hilt? If he's going to play a role going forward, we do need to have some kind of basic understanding of what drives him, what his personality is, what his motives are. But we don't have any of that, and I think that has to be because the show has so much else it wants to get on with. The inevitable issues arising from trying to condense thousands of years of history you don't have the rights to. 
He isn't the only character to suffer under development, but his reappearance here solely as a device to allow the next thing to happen makes him a very good example of a much deeper problem. So then we cut back to Don Lemon, who is crawling into a deep dark hole in search of his journalistic reputation. He hears a noise, he thinks it might be his integrity, so he crawls down further. Then he is being chased by a strange tunnel creature, perhaps Brian Stelter, something even the rats are afraid of. And then he crawls through another tunnel into some water through which he swims to re-emerge in another tunnel. Are you excited? It's all very excited. Isn't the tension palpable? He finds a corner and he hides there, waiting for the monster to come out and attack him, but it appears behind him and he gets grabbed. Whereupon we cut back to... This woman. She goes home to find that the boy with the strange voice who got angry at the floor seems to have been eaten by the floor. But then he appears from inside a little hidey hole cupboard and he tells her to be quiet because something is there and she needs to go and get help because there's something evil in the floor. She goes to run away, but then decides, nah, I don't know. Maybe she thinks, well, I'm a woman and women don't die in rings of power. So instead, she... I thought she was going to turn and fight it. No, she just hides in a cupboard as an evil creature emerges from the depths. This is when we are supposed to be tense. But the show has a problem with breadth and quantity at the moment. We've all been thrown across the world several times in the last few minutes with a number of disparate plot threads to keep track of, and this has the effect of diminishing the significance of any of them. Pacing is important for scenes like this one in particular. They actually need a special kind of build-up, a general slowing of the world, in order that the audience's full attention can be brought to bear, our focus is earned, our heart rates first drop, in order that they can be slowly heightened as the tension builds. This is what separates a good slasher horror from the uncountable Halloween and Jason clones, for example. An understanding of pace and the importance of quiet moments. Rings of Power has no understanding of pace. For this scene to work, we need to inhabit it fully. Our eyes, ears, hearts and minds all need to be attuned to it. And ideally, we need to give a shit about the characters involved in it. In the event, however, the show manages to win our eyes and our ears, but very little else. The other organs are still half in preceding scenes. Anyway, the other evil pit creature, I guess this one is Chris Cuomo, breaks through the cupboard the woman is hiding in, only for Angry Floor Boy to jump out and stab it in the back. But it twats him. It's a peculiar creature. It actually reminds me a little bit of the Predator in Prey, principally I guess because of the bone mask, but some of its movements are similar as well, it's also similarly stupid and shows that predator's same fondness for being bested by untrained women. When its helmet comes off, it is revealed to be, indeed, Chris Cuomo or an orc of some kind. The sequence that follows is just, well, I mean, it's like the show doesn't know what genre it's supposed to be. It keeps flitting between the tropes of several related but distinct formats. This one blends creature feature with slasher horror. And the choreography is just all over the place. Woman pulls out a knife, but in the next shot she's abandoned the knife, so she pulls out a sword with which she stabs the orc creature, which knocks her away, but then somehow gets itself trapped on a bar in the stairs, only for Angry Floor Boy to lasso it and then jump from the ceiling and suspend it, but then the rope snaps. I mean, okay, how the fuck did Angry Floor Boy think to do that? I think he's been playing, like, Assassin's Creed way too much. Anyway, he doesn't get to enjoy the implausibly well-earned kill, though, because the rope snaps. He's a boy, he can't be allowed to take the glory, so that woman, this one, she chops the orc's head off, and in the next scene, she slaps it on the bar in the local pub and demands they all run away to an elven tower. She is now in position of power and authority, which she deserves because I can't believe I'm going to be forced to say this again. She is. In case this isn't all too much already, we then cut back to the middle of the storm where Mighty Morphid Power Elf and Hunk are struggling to survive against lightning and waves. Mighty Morphid Power Elf lashes herself to the mast which then gets struck by fucking lightning, and then she's pulled to the bottom of the ocean by an inconveniently attached weight, so... So she's dead. Again. Just as she should have been several times already. But then, Hunk follows the rope down and fucking frees her, and they swim back to the surface. Which means I guess Mighty Morphid Power Elf has in fact had to rely on someone else for the first and quite possibly the only time in the show. So much is happening. All the things are happening. It's a kaleidoscope of events, all quite pretty, all very hard to make any sense of. And continuing in this theme, around 45 seconds after the storm scene, we're off across the world again. And at this point, it's around 6.30am as I type. And I think I might finally be entering the state of mind you need to retain if you are to unironically enjoy Rings of Power. Zombified and conked out. Just staring blankly at all the lavish events, all the things, all the noise and the movement and the splendid superficialities that sit exactly where the story is supposed to be. 
This is bad robot storytelling. This is J.J. Abrams storytelling. Just bombard the audience with stuff so they can't ask too many questions. They can't engage their brains. Just impress them with things, trivialities, unfathomable stakes. I'm morally certain this kind of storytelling is the precursor to the feelies in Huxley's Brave New World, where people get high on Soma and they just watch the pretty lights and enjoy the beautiful sounds. It's all completely sterile and meaningless, of course, just basely pleasurable. Huxley's been right about pretty much everything else. I'm sure he's right about the direction of cinema as well. So then, we cut away, again, to find Steve hanging out next to a tree looking at the stars. Brandy and Podge come to say goodbye, because they're migrating again soon, and Steve gives them a menacing, I'm from Disney and I'm here to entertain your children kind of stare, and he uses some magic to pop Pudge's lantern, whereupon, like the spaced out space hobo he is, he admires the little fireflies that burst out of it. And in case you didn't get that this is meant to be Gandalf, he talks to them, just as he talked to the moth in Fellowship. You remember? I remember. You think you're being really clever here, don't you, show? So clever. You're so proud of this subtlety. Steve convinces the Fireflies to form a constellation in the sky, and Brandy implausibly deduces that he wants them to help him find those stars. A Firefly lands on Podge's hands, and then it unceremoniously dies, and then the rest of the Fireflies die, and the music becomes ominous, and Steve looks sad. Then we cut across to Moria, where Durin is trying to convince his kingly dad to agree to Celebrimbor's proposal, but his dad is sceptical. King Dwarf, who is yet to be named, is quite a sinister chap. All the dwarves are portrayed quite effectively, it must be said, and he sees the elves darkly. They open a box at the close of this scene. We do not see its contents, but we see that whatever it is, it is glowing. Meaning it is either Marcellus Wallace's ancient briefcase, or else this could well be the setup to some variant of the fight over the Silmaril I described earlier in the context of the Sack of Doriath. Which, well, okay, I'm going to be fair to the show. I'm awake again. The show genuinely is not without all redeeming features. If, again and as ever, you're prepared to accept that for every law familiar thing it does, it completely discards so much else. I think this must count as exploitation, to be frank. And I can see why this will turn off as many people as it, um, well. Turns on maybe isn't the word I'm looking for there, though I don't doubt some of the shills really are turned on. After all, we've got elves of colour now. We have dwarves of colour too. Four. Yeah. I, I, well, I, I wouldn't at all, but, you know, each to their own. My job, of course, is just to review the show. And so, I will say, if, if I put myself in the mindset where I have discarded my objections to its abuse of the law, this setup is intriguing. It's partly intriguing, though, because of the way it appeals to the law it's abusing. It's an awkward thing to judge. I regret that I have to try and suspend my love of Tolkien and the law and the mythos in order to judge it. It's not something I'm going to be willing to do in the long run, but occasionally it's going to be necessary to try and understand the show that everyone else, including non-Tolkien fans, is watching. We can regret that that suspension is necessary, but that is the show we've been given. And I think from time to time it does pay to try and see it as others do. Some of what it does will work if you judge it in its own right. Some of it will work because it calls back two aspects of the law it has seen fit or been able to utilise. And this is one of those instances. If you're teasing something like the Sack of Doriath, for example, or the collapse in relations between the elves and the dwarves, I mean, it depends how much of the lore they're able to use there, because it's a fantastic story. And if they hove closely to that, and don't end up abusing other things by mentioning them out of context, well, it might go some way toward redeeming itself. But I doubt, again I must stress that I doubt, that the show's writers understand how this works. I doubt they will be so respectful, and I doubt it will be that interesting in the end. However, it would be churlish to deny the potential in this scene. Anyway, Angry Floor Boy is playing around with that discarded sword hilt again, and it catches fire in his hand, and it begins to reform itself into a sword. He packs it up, though, and takes it with him as he and... Uh, this woman, that one, again, they go off with their village toward the Elven Tower for sanctuary. Isn't there a knife in the Wheel of Time that gradually corrupts the person holding it? Well, I think that's what we're getting here as well. And then, finally, back on the raft, still miraculously not dead from exhaustion, thirst, starvation, Cthulhu's gay fish, drowning, sunstroke, heatstroke, or being struck by fucking lightning, Mighty Morphid Power Elf and Hunk are discovered by another ship. Mighty Morphid Power Elf passes out. That is the end of the episode. All right then, so we've had our fun. Now it's time to get serious again. What's left to be said? 
I think we'll start with character. The issues of plot and world building can't be so easily separated from each other. Rings of Power has a superabundance of people, but a severe deficit of character. Its most fleshed out and endearing are actually its secondary and tertiary cast, Brandy, Deesa, and Duran principally. Even the first of these isn't without issues. Brandy has an innate rustic charm born of her upbringing and her place in the world, and she benefits from that. The not hobbits are likable precisely because they lack the grandiose pretensions pretty much everyone else in the show besides the dwarves is burdened with. The Lord of the Rings had a similar dynamic with the hobbits, but its other cast actually had personality and quirks. None of them was insufferably severe. Gandalf has a sense of humour, he has worldly wisdom. Aragorn, Legolas and Gimli have fantastic chemistry, with Gimli and Legolas in particular able to lighten the mood of dark times. Even Boromir has a ruggedness to him, a battle-hardened spirit, emotional torment that works against his ego. The Lord of the Rings is a serious story, but precious few of its characters are self-serious 100% of the time, in the manner we see from Rings of Power's inhabitants. Those few who are, Celeborn is the one that really stands out in his short scene, but Elrond and Galadriel by necessity demonstrate some of this as well, nevertheless they do so for a clear purpose, they provide contrast, they are not setting a norm. But even in Brandy, whose interactions with the world are the most inquisitive, and so the most informative, we do see a deficiency of development. Her interactions with the world beyond her tribe are some of the show's highlights, but the writers insist on making a point with her, meaning that every single one of her excursions has to be accompanied by variations of the same argument. She wants to see the wider world, everyone around her thinks she's foolish to do so. And this plays out time and time and time and time and time again. Both The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings deploy the same trope, but with incomparable efficiency and belonging. In The Hobbit, Bilbo himself is of the opinion that the wider world is no place for a baggins, and has to be dragged off on his adventure. The point Rings of Power labours over is just the setup for The Hobbit, it's part of its charm. In The Lord of the Rings, Bilbo's prior adventures have earned the baggins as a reputation among the hobbits as silly adventurers, and that of course is no job for a hobbit. This is in part Frodo's reputation, or the one he's inherited. But this forms part of the world building. It gives character to his and Bilbo's relationship with the Shire and to the Hobbits generally. Its payoff in The Lord of the Rings is in the ironic inevitability of Frodo's departure on a journey he could never have anticipated. The reputation is earned, albeit, and as with Bilbo, not actually sought. Had The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings taken Rings of Power's approach, the entire first quarter of each would have involved both Bilbo and Frodo in repeated conversations with other characters entire sequences at the pub say with Gaffer Gamgee, saying, you can't go out there, it's dangerous, followed by Mary saying, why do you want to go on an adventure, you've got everything you need here, followed by Pippin saying, you're always looking for adventure, it's not natural for a hobbit, followed by Sam saying, why do you always have to be different, Master Frodo, why can't you see the hobbits aren't supposed to mix with the big folk, followed by, and so on, and so on, and so on. Repetitive, tedious, hammering you over the head, with what the writers believe is the point the character must convey, and so distracting you from the actual point the character is supposed to convey, which is the exploration of and learning about the world around them and their growth alongside that world. Oh, my prediction's still outstanding, by the way. I still think they'll end up lingering in camp because of the injury to Brandy's father, and as a result they'll get attacked and killed, and she'll be thrown out into a world far bigger and darker and more dangerous than she could have imagined. And as a setup, that does genuinely contain a lot of potential not least because it should force the rioters to stop hitting us over the head with what they think the point of the character is, and instead actually get to the point. The only other likeable characters are Durin and Deesa. Not coincidentally, they're the only other characters who actually have anything approaching a personality. They also have evident chemistry, and their portrayals contain enough of the Lord of the Rings era dwarves to salve the irritation of the Hobbit era portrayals. This is an example of the writers not socking you in the face repeatedly with the point though they have benefited thus far by being secondary or even tertiary figures and ciliary characters, while trailers would suggest that Deesa in particular comes to take on a much more prominent role later on. And Sophia Mvet Nom... Sophia Nom... Vit... Nom Veti. One of the two, the actress anyway, she's been one of the most vocal about the brilliance of representation, and both of these facts combine to make you a little bit fearful of the future for the character. Side characters often lend outsized amounts of colour and character to the works they feature in, the video game analogy is between well-realized and generic NPCs. If they push Durin, and in particular Deesa, toward the fore of the story, then the writers will probably want to stress the point with them as well, and that might end up detracting from the good and charming work they've genuinely achieved so far. They are as yet the most personable of the cast, 
by which I mean you can actually imagine their daily lives off screen and imagine them enjoying themselves, which is not something you can say for Elrond, and it's certainly not something you can say for what the show still insists on calling Galadriel. In fact, Durin lends some much needed character to Elrond in the scenes they share together. Grand stakes need the local, the familiar, and the personal for us to really invest in them and understand what they are about. The classic example in this canon is from The Two Towers, when Merry and Pippin receive the Ents' rejection after their entreaties for aid in the war against Saruman. And we're made to see how dire this rejection is, first by Pippin's lazy assumption that they can just go back to the warm heart of the Shire and be fine, the world's too big for them but they'll always have the Shire. And then Merry's reply that actually no, even home isn't safe from Sauron's and Saruman's menace. Rings of Power's desire to be grand has seen it overlook or just speed through these kinds of setups, but it's telling that on the one occasion it actually lets us dwell on something local and personal, Durin's exchange with Elrond on the lift is the most real and meaningful of all the character exchanges in the show so far. For the good work done here though, see the counterpoint, the person they call Galadriel. I am struggling to think of a more sterile depiction of a lead. Even Ray Palpatine has a certain amount of charm to her, at least in The Force Awakens. Daisy Ridley's acting falls below porn star quality, but her natural personality shines through in at least some of the scenes. Mighty Morphid Power Elf, by contrast, just gives us nothing. The point, the writers are incapable of subtlety when it comes to the points they want to push, is strong, independent, powerful renegade who sees what no one else will see, who is driven by righteous anger and vengeful zealotry. But despite being so much more involved and active than ever we see her in The Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power's Galadriel can't convey an ounce of the power, purpose, and personality conveyed by Kate Blanchett in the Jackson films. Galadriel is supposed to be, in some senses, cold and aloof, unfathomably and even threateningly, hauntingly beautiful. We know she is powerful. The Lord of the Rings establishes all of this in a single scene, but Rings of Power can't even lay the foundations of it across two hour-long episodes. Instead, what we have is a character, actually no character is way too strong a word, what we have is just an entity, a cutout, a thing on our screens that makes it impossible not to invoke the strong whammon line of criticism, because the show is designed to invite that criticism. Regular viewers will know I really fucking hate that line. It's shallow as a criticism, it's unsubtle, it doesn't do anything to explain why said strong whammon is objectionable, or indeed what can be done to fix it. Not all strong whammon that are called strong whammon are strong whammon in the same ways, it's normally more interesting to actually delve into the flaws of the individual characters being criticised, but in this case, no, that term, the criticism, all of its entailments, it's pretty much entirely correct. Rings of Powers' is Galadriel is just unrelatable. Her perfection isn't ethereal, it's material. She's the bestest fighter, the bestest visionary, the bestest swimmer, the one who is so awesome that all the events of the world have been made to revolve around her. But she's also empty, she's devoid of personality, she's had no growth, she's entirely one-dimensional in belief, philosophy, and in outlook. Even where attempts are made to insult her, those insults drive home how incredibly stunning and brave she is. She is the point of Rings of Power, and as has already been established, the writers are incapable of delivering a point without smashing our faces into it repeatedly. Because it's all really about her, and because the point is to portray how awesome she is, the writers have taken a lazy approach in throwing her from dramatic scene to dramatic scene, with the stakes increasing each and every time, to the point where, across maybe 10 minutes of screen time and two episodes, she climbs the wall, she somehow manages to take down a snow troll and make the whole thing seem offensively smug, she discovers the big bad, she goes to heaven, she rejects heaven, she gets attacked by Cthulhu's gay fish, she smacks down her hunk, she gets caught in a storm, she gets struck by lightning, she gets pulled from the bottom of the ocean. This is what bad writers do when they want to big up their protagonist. They put them in constant drama, they make everything in the world, from animals to the fucking weather, about her. Which leaves the character no time to grow, and her personality no time to develop. Yep, the point is she is cold and angry and vengeful. But that's not a personality, that's a premise for a personality. It's not been made a subject yet. Comparing her to the protagonists of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings is just pointless. The difference is so stark, you can't really say anything about it without being accused of over-explaining, because the difference is so obvious that it doesn't need words. But let's compare her to some of the secondary characters, who also have seemingly single-minded goals. The difference is still palpable. Boromir, for example. Boromir is skillful, strong, seemingly clear-minded. He wants the power of the ring to shield Gondor from Sauron. 
but Boromir has conflicts that create his character. He might be clear on his desire for the ring, just as Mighty Morphid Power Elf is clear on her desire for revenge, but his desire for the ring clashes with who he is as a person, which is a decent, honorable, noble, and put-upon person. He is weighed down by the weight of expectation, the need to defend his people. It's his desperation that leads to his fall, and it's the triumph of his better nature that leads then to his redemption. He has a character, and his character has an arc. Similarly, we can compare Mighty Morphid Power Elf with Saruman. Saruman is seemingly simple, but deceptively complex as a character. He likewise desires the ring. He seems single-minded in his pursuit of it. But again, you have clashes within character. Saruman's relationship with his goal is subtle. Some trace of his old values remain in him. They flash through from time to time. It's better expressed in the book when Gandalf the White arrives back at Isengard to confront him on his crimes. But prior to that, in the film, we see the sense of terror, regret, and a darkness, a self-recognition he conveys as he passes Sauron's orders to his orcs. He knows what he's doing, and he knows what it means, and I think the impression is given at least that he knows what he's about to sacrifice, and he does feel some sense of loss. Even in his hunt for the ring, there is a suggestion of deeper motive. He's been corrupted by Sauron through the Palantir, but he isn't in fact quite enthralled to Sauron. He wants the ring for himself, and it's implied that he, with the unique power of his voice, may in fact be playing Sauron just as much as Sauron is playing him. Saruman is enthralled to greed first and foremost. Unlike Denethor, the Palantir has not defeated his psyche. He has agency. He wants to take Sauron's place in the end. Neither of these two characters, Boromir or Saruman, is a protagonist. They each have just a fraction of the screen time, not Galadriel has been given so far in Rings of Power only two episodes in. Yet in that fraction of screen time, they, who are just as driven as she is in their own ways, become so much more than their mere ambitions and desires. They become true characters. Rings of Power has had two hours with Mighty Morphid Power Elf as its protagonist. She has done so much more than any single character in the entirety of The Lord of the Rings does, with the arguable exception of Frodo. But while every character in The Lord of the Rings is a character, understandable, even in most cases worthy of sympathy and certainly respect, she just isn't. She has a worrying number of the hallmarks of a Mary Sue, all the powers of a fanfiction self-insert. I think, I hope anyway, the writers will try to undercut her zeal at some stage. They've shown a few signs that they wish to explore the flaws arising from her single-mindedness. But how long will they take to do it? And will anybody really be still around to appreciate it if they've been bombarded with perfection for hours and hours and hours before the first hint of a fault? And will they be able to present it as a genuine flaw and failing even, or will they just do what they've already done, insulting her with praise and having her failures prove she was right? Anyway, that's enough with the characters, so what about the plot and the world building? These two things are not easily separable in Rings of Power. The plot at this stage is merely an ambition, it's a skeleton. Find Sauron beats Sauron. The show is attempting to put flesh on that skeleton with its various subplots, each of which with the exception of Elrond and Celebrimbor, is clearly oriented in the same direction. Brandy and Steve, Don Lemon, and Mighty Morphid Power Elf are in their own ways unraveling parts of the same mystery. The problem, however, is scale, and the fact so much that happens relies on building so much of so many different parts of the world around these scenes as they happen. The Lord of the Rings wisely does not take this approach in its first book and film. The journey is linear, a video game analogy might help here too. Imagine you're playing a strategy game, and you're controlling a single unit or a squad of units, and the game has just started. As you move, you clear the fog of war, but you clear it linearly, contiguously, and in one direction, whatever direction you've chosen. You are not overwhelmed by the entire map in one go, or distracted by the clearing of disparate patches of it at the same time. You learn the mechanics in the local section of the map, that slowly introduces you to the other parts, such that when you do begin to clear the rest of the map, or when the clearing ceases to be linear, you're at least comfortable enough with the way the world works and you have some foreknowledge of what you then come to see. This is the approach Fellowship of the Ring takes. Only in the two towers do we begin to see the narrative split between characters and geographies, but by that point, we're already quite familiar with those characters and geographies. Aragorn, Legolas and Gimli in Rohan, Merry and Pippin with the Urukai at Sam, and Saruman at Isengard are already familiar to us. The exploration of brand new regions is largely reserved for Frodo, Sam, and Gollum at Emin Muil, the Dead Marshes, the Black Gate, and Gondor, though even these latter two are already partly familiar to us. By contrast, Rings of Power jumps frequently across vast tracts of Middle-earth, 
with characters and locales we are decidedly not familiar with. The numerous Indiana Jones map sequences and the introduction of new places with title cards explaining their name and their purpose is therefore necessary, but the fact it's necessary is, I would say, evidence of a problem. So much is happening on so vast a scale, and without any real time to familiarise ourselves with the places, that we are distracted from the plot, we are distracted from the plot by the subplots, we are distracted from the subplots by other subplots, and from other subplots by the new worlds we are shown, which we are then quickly distracted from again by the subplots, and then back to the plot, and then from the subplots, and so it goes. We never settle in any one place at one time long enough to really grasp where we are, who we're with, what it all means, how they all link together. The writers have this problem too, which is what leads to such spectacularly stupid contrivances as Gil Galad sending not Galadriel away because she might actually find the evil they both know is out there, and this would be a bad thing, while ignoring it is preferable. I mean, this is something the writers have just chosen because this is what is convenient for them to do. They have to ignore it for large periods in order that they are allowed to jump from place to place and get on with other things they want to do. But it's a hard ask of an attentive audience to agree to ignore this because it is so obviously stupid to ignore it. In a sense, the fact Rings of Power is billed as the Lord of the Rings show is both its biggest strength and its biggest weakness. Of its strength, there is an awful lot of material in the appendices for it to draw on created by somebody so much more thoughtful and intelligent than the writers of this show that he might as well belong to a different species. The fact it can borrow liberally from his treasures allows them to recreate parts of the most lovable and intricate world ever created for fiction. It gives, rightly, the impression of vast scope and untold depths. It gives the impression of long lore and rich history. And that impression is not entirely inaccurate, because the lore it's borrowing from does offer all of these things. A show of this scope and scale would not be possible without those parts of the lore that it is able to borrow from. It isn't just because these writers are shit, we've seen numerous competent fantasy writers over decades labour to emulate Tolkien and fail even to mimic what he accomplished. But that is also its weakness. It's borrowed enough to make its world vast, but too little to make it deep, too little story to justify its scale, and its characters, all of whom are in some way invented, including those whose names match the lore, are too spread out in time and in geography and they are too recently put in place to really convey the sense of history and the feel of an inhabited world. The fact it borrows so much also reminds us of all the things it's left out, and the way it's perverted, therefore, its source material. Not only in its storytelling and style, but also in its spirit and its soul and its moral purpose. To do anything other than a faithful adaptation is to make an unfaithful adaptation where Tolkien is concerned. It isn't that there is nothing of Tolkien in Rings of Power. There is. There's quite a lot. I've yet to hear anyone argue otherwise who isn't performatively hating on the show for clout or overreaching in accusations of blasphemy. But no, the problem isn't that Rings of Power just completely discards Tolkien, it's that it takes him and misuses him. It's like one of those Chinese companies built on the theft of Western intellectual property. Not only the logos of Western companies, but the things they make. The fabricated not Nike, the Chinese equivalent of the iPhone. It isn't just the branding they've twisted, they do actually produce content and product, but that content and product has also been stolen and twisted and corrupted. The result is eerily familiar, but unquestionably different, cheaper and tackier. It carries the stench of a kind of immorality with it. This is a knockoff society, a fabricated culture, one that exists by stealing the true works of better men and then corrupting them and flogging whatever comes of it at a discount. Which of course, people invariably buy. They buy it in their millions. The knockoff brands are cheaply sold to the countries from which they were first stolen. This is one of the many reasons I said in my House of the Dragon video that normies are perpetually disappointing. There is a mass audience that frankly does not care very much about art, literature, history, or the production of same. They want cheap thrills, and they will be satisfied with them. Eventually, they might notice that the Chinese phones they're buying don't seem quite as good as the phones they used to have. Eventually, they might notice the Bangladeshi factory clothes they wear all seem to fall apart a little bit too quickly. Eventually, they might have some vague awareness that the summer blockbuster just isn't quite as entertaining and intelligent as it used to be. Some of them might even wake up as to the reasons why. But the majority won't. I've lost count of the number of times I've been told when critiquing an MCU film or a Jurassic World or whatever else, well, it's just a blockbuster. You're not supposed to think too hard about the blockbuster. To which my answer will always be, is this particular blockbuster better than Jaws? Is it better than Jurassic Park? Is it better than Empire Strikes Back? And since the answer is invariably no, the corollary question is, maybe you should think about why that is. 
but most normies just won't engage on these particular points. If the consumer does not demand, the culture will not produce for them. And Rings of Power is the example par excellence of a slow tragedy that it's only really one, albeit very expensive, part of itself. But, and to close, well, I said back at the beginning, this tragedy itself has a purpose. And that purpose is bigger than the tragedy itself. So we've seen, albeit in just two episodes, what happens when this desire for material domination so spectacularly misses the moral, philosophical, and spiritual purpose of the thing that is desired. As a reminder, Jeff Bezos is the Melkor to Tolkien's Iluvatar. He loves creation, but he doesn't understand it. He thinks he can own it and steward it, while he is himself a part of it. All his schemes and grand designs are subordinate to those that govern him. All the evil his love produces is, in a sense, intended by creation itself. So while Rings of Power is a tragedy, it's not a fault in the system, it's just proof of it. We are drowning in shit media. We are smothered by shit media. We're living in an era where petty political shit weasels who can't create anything for themselves have sought to corrupt the foundations of society and of culture. Common and timeless myths have been made petty, particular, and time-stamped for current fads and inclinations. The great works of ages past have been co-opted by idiots and mendacious little fucking morons for whom escapism is the enemy. All our fantasy has to reflect the modern world, and in particular, our warped understanding of the modern world. There is no justice, there is social justice, there is no commonality, there is political community. Nothing is right, it is merely appropriate, there is no universality, there is diversity and representation. Civilization is colonialism, justice is bigotry, the good is an imperial imposition. Nothing is constructed, everything is deconstructed. Our founding fathers, our founding myths, must be torn down in order that nothing can take their place. This is chaos, and we see it, we feel it everywhere. Chaos is all around us, it seems inescapable. For perhaps the first time, our dominant religion is both secular and nihilistic. There is no higher ideal or aspiration, but these things are all steeped in original sin and must be expunged by sacrifices on the altar of modern fashion. And it feels fucking horrible, doesn't it? It does seem like the end of everything is corruption and destruction. What can men do against such reckless hate? But I promised I'd round off that analogy begun however the fuck long ago, and so I will. And I will do it with an injunction, if you'll pardon me. Do what these writers either could not or would not do. Go back to the law. Read the Silmarillion. I don't care if you find it difficult, a lot of people do. It is dense, some people find it unrelatable, but go back and read it. Read it with this in mind. All of the chaos and the destruction, all the division and the domination, well that's not the end in the Silmarillion, that is the beginning. That is creation, that's what the world is formed from. This is what it was always meant to be, without it we would have nothing. The rest of the Valar despaired at Melkor's discordant ambitions, they fought against him, the children of Iluvatar fought against him, and they lost time and time and time again. They could never defeat evil eternally, it's always there. Even in the Lord of the Rings, Sauron is vanquished, the hobbits return to the Shire, but they find evil has taken root there as well. Saruman and Grima have bribed a piddling little businessman, and they've set about industrializing. And so the fight plays out again, albeit on a much smaller scale. But uh, all of this is by design. The Valor and their fight with Melkor is part of the creation myth that is the Silmarillion. Without it, there would be no world to fight for and defend. There would be no invention, no art, and no history, and no lore to lose yourself in, and no stories and adventures born out of it. Without chaos, discord, and division, there would be no Lord of the Rings. There would be nothing. Tolkien used this as the foundation for an entire universe, a theodicy, a morality. We're finally becoming aware of the nature and origin of our own present real-world discontents. We have our own Melkor to fight. We have our own evil to grapple with, and we will never truly, eternally defeat it. So it is entirely up to us what we do next. We can despair that Tolkien has been bought up and paraded, and be miserable and defeatist about it. Or we can do what he did, we can learn from him, and we can create for ourselves. Make something write something. Do something new. For everything we've lost, Star Wars, Star Trek, the MCU, the Lord of the Rings, Wheel of Time, even Resident fucking Evil, if that's your thing, renew and rebuild and carry on the song. Pick up a pen, open a Google Doc, do what I did, hammer away for six months on a typewriter, or do what Eric July is and start your own bloody comic book company from scratch. Don't wait to be given anything of worth by modern activist writers and directors and showrunners. Write it, send it to each other, share stories and ideas, create a new mythos. The great American educator Horace Mann famously said that you should be ashamed to die until you've done something for humanity, so don't wait for other people to give their gifts to you. You'll be waiting a damn long time given the state of modern media. 
In Tolkien's mythos, we all have Iluvatar's creative song in us, so let's fucking sing it for ourselves. And I want in on this, so if you want to fire anything at me, ideas, scripts, stories, poems, music, whatever, hit me up, I'm at PlatoonPod on Twitter, we can take it from there. Links are in the description. And I will see you, and I will get to the race-swapping angle in the next video. Next time on Crab. Your show is terrible. Your show is terrible. Your show is terrible. Your show is terrible. The sea is always right. The sea is always right.